Okay. All right. So welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Chan Jan Bon. I'll be your host today. So welcome to the Malaysia Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery Virtual Workshop 2021. The theme this year is step-by-step scleral fixation of intraocular lenses. So there will be two sessions. The first session will be sutured IOL fixation, and the second session will be a sutureless IOL fixation. In between the session, there will be sponsors video from Elcon Zeiss and TGM. So some of the housekeeping announcement, do log in with your full name. This is for attendant purpose um, and mute yourself during the presentation. So raise your hand if you have any questions, uh, if you want to ask a live questions and put all your questions in the Q&A box. If not, we cannot track the uh, question. And stay, stay, stay till the end so that you will get your CBD points. There will be two CBD points for this uh, session. This whole session uh, will be recorded and we will put it in our MSO Facebook. Please like and join the Facebook page. Uh, there's actually two Facebook pages. One is actually the group for community and the other one is actually for uh, the doctor's group. So do join the doctor's group if you're a doctor. Uh, so we will first introduce our MSCRS president, Dr. Lee Man Wai. He is the, a graduate of University of Manchester and started his basic ophthalmic training in UK and completed his advanced training in Singapore. He's, uh, he's also completed a vitro retinal fellowship in Lions Eye Institute, Western Australia. He's currently the medical director of LEC Eye Center in Ipoh, Malaysia, and also the chair of the Malaysian Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. So without further delay, let's welcome Dr. Lee Manwai to give his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen Bon, and much appreciated for your help with this webinar. I worked you in pretty much the last minute and you've done everything very well. Thank you. So I think uh, as what uh, Dr. Chan mentioned, so please log in with your actual full name so we can you know, send out the certificates of uh, the attendance as well. So this time around, we are focusing on, uh, we call it a workshop, and we're going to try to go through step by step uh, about scleral fixation in the different techniques. And hopefully there'll be a bit more time spent on the individual steps. And the idea is so that everybody can, uh, those that want to start out doing this, you know, the thought processes are there and, you know, the preparation to start your case will be there. So there'll be ample opportunity to ask questions along the way and post into the Q&A or raise your hand and ask questions verbally during the panel discussion. So with us here, we have a panel of stellar speakers from Malaysia. We have uh, Dr. Rajan Aliza. I think Dr. Cha will introduce everybody, Dr. Wawai Chung, Prof. Musha from uh, UKM, and our esteemed panelists all the way from East Malaysia. I think Dr. Peter Kong and Dr. Dennis Kong as well. So after we look forward to an interactive session. Now, just to start out now, we're going to actually just do a quick poll. I think those of you here, so I have Dr. Chan just flash up a little poll just to see what everyone's experience is with uh, management of you know, certain complex scenarios where you don't have capsular support. So just uh, click what you uh, tend to do or what you believe that you will do. You can actually select more than one method and um, just like to get an idea just to start off. And remember to press submit after you have clicked your options and uh, Dr. Chan will be able to tabulate all your answers and share it out. And at least we get to see a spread of experience of uh, what we have in our audience amongst us today. So it's been a challenging time for us in the last, what, 18 months now. I think the webinars have become something of a norm and it's the new norm. I think this won't go away. I think even when we get back to normal at some point, we were doing more and more webinars. Uh, a little bit of fatigue, I'm sure, from all. But I hope that usually these sessions can be uh, beneficial and it can actually uh, guide our practice to some extent. Uh, we have got now, can you see the number of responses coming in, Dr. Chan? Yeah, one, 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 this is 60 over percent. It's still coming in. Do you want to wait another 30 seconds? Yeah, 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 sure. I think yeah. we've got another minute before we get the program start, uh, started. I think people, people are really thinking about their yeah. uh, answers. <laughs> So another 20 seconds, and then after that, we have a look, and then we can start our program. All right. 
So still coming so in. <laughs> Dr. Chan mentioned earlier just now, we also have some sponsors and they're very grateful for their contribution to make this webinar a success. Alcon, Zeiss, and TGM. We're gonna have uh, share some of their videos as well afterwards. So I should uh, end my polling now. Yep, thank you. <laughs> Looks like ACIL is still leading actually. Oh, I didn't share the results, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'll get it, there it is. Okay, hey. so we've got quite a good number of ACIOL, iris claw lens, and then scleral fixation we've got in the 20%, which is not too bad. I think uh, hopefully from today, scleral fixation, we're not here to convince you that that's the best way, but this is a session on how you can actually do it. And hopefully from this session, you can see um, why we think I think most of us here, why we think that will be our primary way of doing such things. Okay, thank you very much. Back to you, Jambon. All right, so I shall first, we'll start off with our first session, the suture IOL fixation segment. So our first topic uh, will be by Dr. Dr. Roger Noliza. She's the current head of department of uh, ophthalmology in Hospital Malacca. She's actively involved in training the medical officers and postgraduate candidates and serve as one of the frequent MOH examiner for master's program in ophthalmology. Dr. Raja has special interest in glaucoma and refractive surgery and is involved in many complex surgery. She has published many papers and is actively involved in research in ophthalmology. So let's welcome Dr. Uh, Raja Noliza. Please unmute yourself. Teresa, you muted. <laughs> All right, sorry, sorry. Thank you, I'll start again. Thank you, Jen Bond, for your kind introduction. And a greeting from Laika, very nice weather. Rain just stopped about two hours ago and it's cooling. So we shall start now with a conventional sutured Scleral fixated IOL. Before I go into my part, my real uh, part of uh, talk, I would just like to bring all of you to the history of a sutured scleral uh, of a scleral fixated IOL. In a, uh, at the beginning, it was started in 1980 by Mel Brown uh, and his colleague, where he introduced by fixing this uh, intraocular lens to the sclera. And at that time, uh, there's no flap. They don't use flap and the suture is externalized onto the scleral surface. And what happened during that time is that there's a lot of uh, suture erosion because it's exposed under the conjunctival and which has led to a few cases of endophthalmitis. And following that, in 1991, Louise uh, introduced the creation of flap to hide this suture and also he introduced a docking technique of externalizing the, the needle. Whereas earlier it was done more of uh, ab internal, it's a kind of blind procedure. And this uh, in 1991, uh, uh, Louis started this docking method. But again, with this method is a um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, you have to open up a conch, create a flap, and then suture the IOL, and then you have to close the sclera. It's very tedious, tedious process. Therefore, Hoffman in 2006 uh, introduced a pocket to hide this uh, knot that uh, holding the IOL. And again, uh, you, in this method, you still have to tie the knot, tie the suture to the IOL. And uh, you know it still takes a lot of time. So in 2007, Sharots uh, introduced intrascleral fixation of the IOL, where he buried, kind of buried in, in the scleral tunnel, the haptic of the IOL. But again, um, a few episodes of IOL dislodge occur with this method. So Agarawal and friends in 2008 popularized this method by adding glue to it. And again, this um, 
what do you call that? You have to open up a flap again and a uh, sclera flap and glue it. And the latest one is Dr. Shin Yamani make a hit with his technique of Yamani technique. And I think this technique is a very uh, promising technique and I think it's going to be in the market for a long time. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, now I will go to the actual part of my talk. Whatever method that you choose for your patient to fixate the IL to the sclera, certain principles, surgical principles that we have to follow. First of, all, first of all, IL should be placed at the sulcus. Why? Because this is the, the physiological place for the IL to be and that will give the optimum uh, visual uh, corrective uh, correction to the patient. And how to achieve that is by fixating it two millimeters posterior to the limbus. Another thing is that these two fixation points has to be 180 degrees to each other apart, and it has to be aligned uh, with the point at the center of the cornea. So if your patient has, um, a kind of eccentric pupil, then it might not be suitable for this. Or you can still can do, but you have to sort of uh, do a pupiloplasty and make sure that the uh, pupil is at the center. So these are whatever method that you choose for to, uh, to fixate your sclera, uh, your IL at the sclera, then you, we have to follow this to ensure success. Now let's go to my sutured uh, sclera fixation. It can be done in two ways. One is two-point fixation and the other one is four-point fixation. The two-point fixation is where you use a single thread, a single suture material. Normally we use a non-degradable material, which is proline. And uh, with a straight needle, I use to, to use uh, one end a straight needle and the other end is a curved needle and pass it through and through by docking method and externalize this part of the suture and cut it and suture it to the eyelid of the IOL. Whereas the four point, you use a two suture material or if you understand, you still can use one, uh, just that you have to dock twice and then externalize these, these two sutures, cut it and uh, tie it to the eyelid of the IOL. Uh, now let's see my video. How I do, uh, this is a case, a very unfortunate case of, of uh, a boy, young boy that sustained a corneal laceration. One thing, when we decided to do a sclera fixated IOL, meaning that our, the eye that we're going to do is not a straightforward case. It, it's, uh, you know, it's like um, a complex cases like uh, pseudo exfoliation with a compromised zonules, a marfan or a, Trauma. So in this case, what I'm, uh, the video that I'm going to share with you is a following a trauma. This child uh, had a quite bad corneal laceration. At that point of time, she, he was very young and um, uh, together with the extensive loss of uveal tissue. And we went in for many times for this child. Uh, first, we have to go in and suture the cornea and then go in, went in again to remove the ruptured lens and cerebral tract. And because he's young, then he developed a uh, cyclitic membrane. Then we went in again, remove and do a proper vitrectomy. Uh, this is the eye by then. Looking at the post segment, it's still good. Optic nerve function is still good. Macular is normal. So I thought there will be, uh, I mean, a uh, benefit if we implant the IOL. So I have decided to uh, implant IOL, what kind of IOL that you want to implant. This, ha this has to be a scleral fixated. You cannot implant uh, sutured, uh, what you call iris, uh, uh, what you call uh, iris uh, support IOL. So, and what kind of IOL? So, because of so much of iris tissue that lost, so I've decided to put in an IRD IOL. And in the market right now, and I read it, I will, uh, there's none that can be folded or can be injectable. All uh, PMMA uh, made IOL. Therefore, the wound has to be big, at least 11 millimeter. And therefore, I have to make rather a big peritomy. So let's see. So my peritomy has to be almost like a three quarter to include the 
formation of the scleral flap. Then I mark the cornea 180 degree with the center passing in the center of the cornea. And then creating the flap to hide the knot for the IOL eyelid, I mean the IOL uh, suture uh, IOL eyelid. The flap you can make triangular or, sec, uh, or rectangular, doesn't matter, but just that part, we have to make quite a big base so that it's easier handling, about half thickness of the sclera. You don't have to make until it reach the limbus because we are not doing try back, but the apex of the flap is at least about three millimeter because your entry point of the needle will be at two millimeter. Now I have to make a, a big scleral wound. Usually I'll do this when the eye is not touched yet. Make sure it's a firm eyeball to go in. And as uh, usual, three step of uh, limbal incision. As you all know, the this uh, the lens that I'm going to insert is a big lens, so I prefer a scleral wound to minimize uh, uh, damage to the cornea by the suture. There's a lot of uh, some PAS over there. Then I uh, put in a viscoelastic, basically to firm, make the eyeball firm and to protect the endothelium. Now, preparation of the retriever of the of the needle later, I like to bend the 27 gauge needle so that this area, the bent area, serve as a kind of grip for the straight needle of the polyn when it goes in. So that when you pull it, you retrieve it, it will come up. Okay, one thing I want to talk about uh, the orientation of the needle. When you go in, uh, I used to make it almost perpendicular to the scleral surface. Uh, yeah, once you see the needle and you can change the you can change the direction of the needle. Here I would like just to share with you. Um, uh, what happens if when you don't uh, put in, introduce the needle perpendicular to the ocular surface? This is another case. Sorry for the poor video. Please ignore the name. And uh, yeah, what happened is that, please focus to this area. What happened is that the needle is not perpendicular to the ocular surface and the needle has catched the peripheral part of the iris the iris root. So what will happen is that in this case, you use a, a fairly big bone needle, you can easily see that. But what happened if you use a small needle like a polyne 10 o needle, fine needle, you might miss that. Another thing that what might happen is when you, if you didn't catch your iris, but you entered the, the sclera obliquely, anteriorly, then your fixation point might be not at two millimeter, millimeter as what you plan. It will be less than two a millimeter. So let's go back to the to the our video. Uh, we have to be right back. Okay. Now the insertion of the needle, the retrieving needle again perpendicular. Once you see, you can see the needle tip. You can bend it forward and introduce the uh, the straight needle of the pulley. You push as much as you can. Hopefully it pass the pen part and it form like a grip. And you can pull it out easily. Yeah. So this is a two point position of a scleral flap. Then I will enlarge it to prepare for insertion of the IOL. Then I will exterior, externalize this suture. One thing if you do a, a sutured scleral fixation, uh, you must always orientate yourself. For oh, this thread is belong to which side? This uh, this end is belong to which side of the flap? Because it's very important. Otherwise, your suture will get tangled within the eye. So now you orientate. I orientate myself. Okay, this part of the belong to this side, and this end is belong to this side. Now I prepare the for the IOL insertion. So in this case, this is the uh, NIRIDIA IOL made of PNMA. This is the black part of the surface iris. And this is the optical part. The size of the optic, you can choose uh, uh, 
accordingly. Uh, yeah, this is tying one of the eyelet with the free end uh, towards the right side of the flap. Huh? I mean, belong to the right side of, of the flap. Okay, one thing I want to make note is, is that when you suture, please suture, I advise you to suture the knot facing towards outside outer surface of the of the eyelid not the inner surface as you when it, if you if you tie it to the inner surface here then when you try especially if you use a soft IOL which I'm going to show you later what will happen is that when you uh, firmly try to center the IOL this part of the eyelid might sort of rotate it and can cause uh, lens, uh, what you call this, uh, tilting of the lens. Okay, then you tie to the other eyelet in a usual manner, the knot facing outside, uh, facing outside of the eyelet, so that when you fix it, it's facing the scleral surface of the wall of the eye. All right, now it's time to please cut correctly. Don't cut a wrong eyelid, a long, a wrong suture. It happened. So now I just stopped the video for a while and I would like to mention a few things. Yeah, okay. Now we have this eyelid that's sutured to the right side of the flap and this eyelid supposed to go to this the left side of the eyelid. So when you want to introduce the IOL into the eye, which haptic that will be your leading haptic and which haptic that will be your uh, trailing haptic. So uh, I would suggest that you insert the haptic that's supposed to go to the right side of the flap as your leading haptic. And this side of the of the, the trailing haptic will become will go to the left side of the flap. Why? It's because when you insert, it's uh, is uh, what you call this when we dial is uh, clock hours, isn't it? So when you when this part uh, this leading haptic goes in, when you pull this string or this uh, suture, it will just rotate almost is ninety degree. And we pull this side from uh, this uh, haptic, the leading, ha uh, the trailing haptic. It will just move 90 degree. So, and uh, I would advise you not to dial IOL of a scleral suture scleral fixator. If you dial it full turn, you'll be drowning inside it. You will know which belong to which side, and the loop might just. And the, the suture might just loop around the IOL and then you have to take it out and redo everything. So it's a, a hassle. So make your orientation correct from the very beginning. So what you do is, yeah, this part will be the leading haptic and make sure that as short as possible so that it doesn't tangle inside the eye. As you push in, you can sort of pull gently into the eye and it will rotate and will go here. So the leading haptic will go to the right side, to the right side of the flap, the right flap, and this will go to the left flap. And uh, you can now center the eye, uh, look like a part of the iris here. But one thing, I want to uh, advise you when you try to centralize this IOL, please pull both sides simultaneously so that you get a firm, uh, firm uh, centration of the IOL. I think caught by the iris and then you pull, pull simultaneously both sides and try to produce equal tension. Yeah, now the IOL look centered. All right. What I do normally in uh, cases like this, I won't fix the suture first. What I do, I will close the wound, I remove the viscoelastic and make sure the eye in a firm condition, almost like normal without the viscoelastic. Then I use this curve, the, the other end of the needle, the, the suture, which is a curve, curve needle, to fix it. 
one thing I want to uh, stress here, when you tie a knot to a loop, make sure that you pull both sides of the loop. I mean, both sides. Yeah, if you notice that I don't really hold it, I just loop around it. So that both sides you get a, a firm knot, otherwise your knot will be loose because you're not sure which, which one that is will be tightened. And then, uh, yeah, and then you repeat the same thing. The balance of that curve uh, suture from the, with the curve needle, I will use it to create like a base of for tying the knot. That be, uh, tying the suture that belong to the, the, lead, the trailing haptic of the IOL. Yeah, this suture to itself, so it form like a base and then you suture it to the to the suture that holding the the other end of the haptic, the other haptic. All right, and then. Sorry, Norlisa, I want to interrupt you. Could we just uh, summarize a little bit? Just uh, going to need some time for discussion. Oh yeah. Okay. I think that's it. I'm going to stop here. Any any final points to highlight, perhaps? Uh, yeah, um, I, I think I mentioned that. Okay. I think I move on. Okay, this will, the eye after penetrating keratoplasty. Do you do I have time for the next one? Um, or is it my time over? Time, actually, we are into the discussion slot now. Do I have time? Uh, if not, uh, I can just stop here. If, is that okay? Yeah. Then fine. We, fine. But actually, actually, I wanted to show just a four-point fixation through a Hoffman pocket, but it's fine. I, I think I took a long time on the other, uh, Perhaps my earlier video. If you can just show the finer points of your Hoffman pockets. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. I just show you the video, yeah. This is a uh, Hoffman pocket. One thing that uh, I want to stress is that when you want to make a clear cut to create that pocket, please make it the clear cornea. Don't make a nick on the cornea diver because that will create, that will hinder your view when you advance the, uh, what do you call that, the crescent knife. Then you won't be able to see the, you won't be able to see your tip of your crescent blade. Uh, and another thing is that watering the cornea itself may balloon up the cornea diver. So that is creating the pocket. Now the same thing, yeah. I think that's about all. Uh, in Hoffman pocket is actually the creating the pocket is is something that you really need. I just want to share with you. Actually, this is a foldable uh, sclerophysated IOL. All right. The rest all the same. It's just that hook it out the two ends of the the uh, of the sutures. You just need to hook it up and. Uh, yeah, that's it. I think that's about all. This is just hooking out the two, uh, the two suture, suture end, and tie it to, together. All right. I think that's all from me. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Can I uh, invite all the uh, for the panel discussion? Oh, so uh, I'm going to introduce Prof. Garizan. Uh, Dr. Prof. Karizan is actually the current associate professor and head of the department of the, uh, in the ophthalmology in the Faculty of Medicine in the International Islamic University in Malaysia. Malaysia. He is the recipient of the Malaysia Society of Ophthalmology Achievement Award and Asia Pacific Association of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. Um, next is Dr. Peter Kong. Uh, Dr. Peter Kong is, did his postgraduate training in UM vitreo retinal uh, training in Sussex, UK. He set up his vitreo retinal unit in Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Kota Kinabalu. He's the current practicing, uh, he's currently practicing in Synergy Specialist Eye Center. His special interests, apart from vitreo retinal cases, complex cataract surgery cases. Next is Dr. Peter Kong, uh, sorry, Dr. Dennis Kong. Uh, he's a consultant eye surgeon and medical director of the Eye Specialist Center. Uh, and with special interest in complex cataract surgery. He's the founder of BOSS and passionate about surgical video recording and presentation. So let's have uh, the panel discussion now. Uh, so 
Actually, uh, the first question, Dr. Raja, can I know what lens you were using in the last video? Oh, the, the last one, use? yeah, there's one question actually for that. Uh, the last uh, is a foldable clarifizator by Mosher 90L. Oh, uh, 90L, uh, mo the model is 90L, it's a Mosher product. Mm -hmm. It's a foldable, mm -hmm. but it is uh, what you call that uh, hydrophilic lens and is is spherical lens. Does it come with an injector or do you uh, actually, actually I wanted just... to show you that actually just now it, it comes with the folder. Oh, okay. uh, so you need to fold the IOL and you need to have IOL holder. So when you fold the, the IOL, you hold it and introduce it into the eye. So it, it's nice to, to have this pair of uh, for set. Actually, I wanted to share this with you just now, but my time was limited. Yeah. That's, uh, all, that's, that's yeah. all the old days, man. The old days, right? We had a yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. We, yes. We started with the uh, actually we started with a non-foldable, all a PMMA. So we have to make a belly a big wound and then come in a foldable IOL that comes without injector. So we have to have that folder. Yeah. 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 This a, is... a quick comment from maybe each of the panelists before you know there are some questions that have come up there either we can answer them live or perhaps no lisa you can type in the answers later yeah. but any comments from the panelists uh, it's just a very quick one sorry everybody it's just a quick one a few pointers over there which uh, dr niza did very well on that the first one is actually type of suture uh, when uh, somebody actually asks about this uh, uh, suture fixated the first thing i will ask is what kind of suture do you have because that suture will determine a lot on the technique of how you fix it and how you actually bury it. Uh, my question would be with Dr. Noliza is, which one that you prefer? You prefer a triangle flap or, um, uh, you know, um, a square, square. Uh, flap? Uh, you... I, I, I actually, um, if you make a triangle, it's a less area, less area of uh, manipulation. Actually, uh, you you disturb the sclera, the the area surface that you disturb on the sclera is less. I prefer a triangular. Yeah. Than, uh, it's just when I actually assist the but, uh, the MOs uh, for the training, usually that triangle get very small. And ah, yeah. Get, yeah. That's <laughs> why I mentioned just now the base yeah. of the triangle you make must be wide enough at least about 2.5 to 3 mm so that if you get a very slim one it, it can evolve easily all right yeah. dr noliza i think there are a lot of people asking what suture material did you oh use yeah i used the uh, proline 10 o proline 10 -0. one a straight needle the other end a double arm one a straight needle the other one is curved needle i think that's the problem with the it's quite small, isn't it? And you wonder how durable they are. I think that's why a lot of people are actually using uh, Gore-Tex 7.0 to, uh, to yeah. do suturing. But unfortunately, Gore-Tex is not available in Malaysia. Uh, I've What's actually that? tried using 7.0 polypropylene and, and it's quite 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 good for suturing. Yeah, it's but, doable. But it's not. Do, do you feel that it's a bit large? Seven yeah. Slightly large, the... but not not too bad because it's equivalent to Go I think it's equivalent to Gore-Tex uh, seven O, but it's uh, a little bit stiffer. I've is never it, actually handled Gore-Tex. Yeah. Is it is it monofilament or braided? Monofilament. Uh, you can get it from B Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, Dr. Dennis, would you actually entertain do, uh, using 9O instead of 10O? I think 9O would be better than 10 or The bigger, the better, I think. Yeah. Okay. I'm using 9O. I think 7O is too difficult to manipulate. You know? yeah. I use 10O. I use 9O. But 9O is, is, is okay. It's available in the market. Right. Yeah. Peter, you're, you're muted, Peter. you got to unmute yourself. Uh, um... Jen Bond, uh, there's one participant, participant yeah. wants to, uh, what do you call that, uh, ask to whether the four point fixation video can be uploaded. Can I pass the, I, I, I don't know how to sort of. I think maybe we can, we can, we can probably I can pass it to you and put on the link. Oh, you can just, un oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll type in the answer when you type it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm actually using a nine hole proline. Uh, on a single long needle with a with a loop kind of yeah, uh, uh, 
uh, suture. Yeah? So I put the loop over the knot there so that I don't have to tie, I don't really have to tie, I just loop it over the knot. And then I pass through the central wound that you have created. I don't have to go through from the other side, I just go through from the central wound. And then I just pull it through the, the, the uh, sclera flap side. So it's easier actually to, for, for, for beginners to learn that method. Uh, instead of trying to pass the needle from across the other eighty, the other side, yeah, oh, a, yeah. a single yeah. needle will look, yeah, and That's then there are knots inside the eye. Actually, there's a lot of questions. I yeah, think uh, I think Dr. Raju will answer it. Move on. We have to move yeah, on. Yeah, we have to move on. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Noriza, can I trouble you to run through the Q and A? Maybe you can. Type. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at it. Uh, okay. Yes. So uh, we will have Dr. Lee Man Wai for the next talk. His talk will be on uh, sorry. Dr. Lee, your yep. talk. Coming up. Yep. Thank you. Okay, now it's great that you know the first talk has generated so much discussion. Excellent. And I think Dr. Noliza has very nicely highlighted some of the history as well, which is useful. So I'll run through that very quickly on my side. So I'm just going to talk about using sutures as well, but not quite in the same conventional sense, in the, in the sense that when we talk about flange proline, you're not actually tying any knots. So I've got no relevant financial disclosures. And really, you know, the shaky situations that we encounter, I think nowadays, whether this is something that, you know, I think my colleagues here might agree that we seem to be seeing more and more of, so it might be actually, you know, some of the, the, the sins of our, our previous surgeries that we have done. So a lot of the time that we're seeing some loose eye walls, which are getting more frequent, it seems. So what are the options available? So what I intend to do now is just to give a very quick overview in terms of how decision making, or at least how I do it. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into detail about history and pros and cons and all that, because I think um, that will be have covered to some extent by Dr. Noliza and my sp the speakers coming up. So you will know that suture versus sutureless, whether this is uh, one technique is better than the other, it remains to be seen. I think there's a role for everything and share some cases at the end. So when you actually see a patient and you're thinking about scleral fixation or any sort of uh, absent capsular support with the uh, intraocular lens, then of course, the first thing, whether patients are fake or not. I mean, it is a fake, then you obviously have to put in the secondary lens, whether it's going to be an ACR well, as you saw earlier in the poll, you know, there was quite a, a, a large percentage, about 50 odd percent that would do that, or an iris fixated, and you can actually suture an iris fi uh, fixated lens or sutureless, which is also one of the next popular options just now from our poll, the iris claw lens, you can put it in the front or in the back. And then of course, scleral fixation is one of the, well, it is the main focus of the workshop today. And Suchin, I think Dr. Noliza has covered conventional. I'm going to talk about French proline, flanged proline, and sutureless. Uh, the later two speakers will cover that with the various techniques as well. Now, if the patient is not a fake kick, so you're going to have a subluxated eye wall or, or a dislocated eye wall, that will determine whether you're going to go an anterior approach where you need anterior retractomy or you have to do a posterior approach to get to actually fish the lens from the, the back. And that's usually in the realms of the retinal surgeon. Now, the other thing you have to ask yourself, can this IOL be rescued? So am I going to use it again? If you can, so most likely you're going to scleral fixate it. Uh, you may consider stitching it to the iris, but I think most cases you will scleral fixate it. If you can't, then you have to explant the lens and then you know, your options of a secondary lens again are open to those few things. So why? I think Dr. Lundisa already mentioned that this is uh, in Well, in my mind as well, I will agree with her. This is the most physiological position of the lens in the ciliary sulcus. Uh, it can reduce the risk of corneal problems, risk of glaucoma, risk of chronic inflammation. Now, having said that, if you look at the literature and there is no one paper that can tell you exactly that it's proven that all this, uh, putting this uh, sclerofixated lens is better than an ACR well or anything like that. But I think it's, we are all biased to some extent about uh, our own practices. And in my practice, I've taken out enough ACRLs for the following problems that I feel that I will not likely want to put one in. So why not? I think it is technically challenging. It is not for the faint hearted. There's quite a bit of acrobatics you may have to do, especially if you're going to be doing con uh, handling sutures and scleral fixating with sutures. can be time consuming. So you have to give time to do these cases and uh, it's, Something where, you know, as a surgeon yourself, you, you know whether you want to invest the time 
to actually try and do these cases. Uh, the risk of tilt, risk of intraocular hemorrhage, I think Dr. Noliza very aptly showed potential problems, which can be a whole basket of problems like entering the needle, uh, entering the sclera in a different angle, and you cause the erythrodialysis, catch the iris root, you can get bleeding into the eye. Worse still, if you get in the, you can get a suprachoroidal hemorrhage and of course retinal detachment, haptic or suture erosion and doft minded. These are all reported consequences of uh, sclera fixation. And late dislocation has sort of made a move for a lot of us to go towards sutureless because the sutures that, you know, 10 or 9 proline had been reported in the literature of breakages can be somewhat up to 10, 15 years later, which might result in a further dislocation of the lens. And I'll show one case afterwards. So what's happening with the evolution of techniques, Dr. Naliza already showed a nice evolution there. So I won't go into this again. One thing she didn't mention is that after the sutureless trend uh, when Yamane came along and it's actually from Yamane's very innovative uh, uh, using heat to actually create a flange that people came up with this flange 6O or 5O polypropylene technique which again uses suture but not in the conventional manner. So some of the plus points that I've uh, looked at whether you're using sutured or sutureless these are some of the things that I can think of. So when I'm using suture you know to do an IOL rescue you can actually if it's a one-piece lens not a three-piece lens you can actually uh, retain the function of the lens. It could be toric, multifocal perhaps. You don't need to do an eye wall explant, which is an additional procedure. It, however, suture can be more challenging, more time consuming, and all the other problems with dislocation and suture erosion. And the, the reverse is true for the sutureless group of sterile fixation. So as I mentioned, flange proline fixation is still new. If you look at the publications, it probably came up in the last year or maybe 14, 15 months. Uh, Kana Brava started out with it, and I'll share some of his videos, and uses the same principle as Yamane did, but instead of putting a low heat core tree to an haptic, to a, a PMMA haptic or a PVDF haptic, uh, using it for proline, and this time 6O or 5O. So these are the publications that I looked at, and these two papers from uh, Israeli uh, Ehud Asia and Dr. John Wong from Singapore, very nicely highlights uh, the, the uses that you can actually uh, put this flange proline technique to part one where if you have a fakia and of course part two to rescue lenses. So this is a uh, start off with a video that is actually from Sergio Canabrava. This is available on the AAO website and it's actually showing uh, how he uses 6O proline and in this case using an Acreos uh, lens with four eyelets a little bit complicated, I found, but you know he has to loop where the haptic through the both the uh, the eyelets on one side and subsequently the other suture. And it's very important in this video is highlighted how you need to position the lens, how you don't gonna get not gonna get tangled up. I think Dr. Londiza already mentioned how when you're handling sutures, there's a potential to get things all tangled up. And after spending 15 minutes to put those things in, you get into the eye, it's all wrong. You have to take it all out and do it again. So he's actually showing here how this last part he's actually putting through into, uh, into the 27 gauge needle and bringing it out uh, through uh, transconjunctivally. So as you see here, the principle of Yamane here is applied in the sense that the proline suture is burnt or heated with uh, the tip of a, a, a core tree to actually create a little bulb so that it actually uh, fixates the lens in place without having to tie a knot. So this was an innovative thing that uh, Kanabrava himself uh, admittedly said following seeing what Yamane had done, he had thought about this and this is what he came up with. So this was when he first published using this Acreos lens. I've not actually tried this. I have had colleagues that like the Acreos lens, but at the time when they were fixating, they're using a Gore-Tex. I just found that there's a little bit too much effort to be looping through the different eyelets, but of course it can be done. The other way to do it, Sergio Canabrava again has talked about using now, instead of using the Acreos, what can you do? You can use a single piece lens now. So he's actually designed an eyewall punch whereby he actually makes an opening that is large enough for a 6O proline to pass through. So he punches it just uh, inside of the optic haptic junction. And you can see how he will then pass uh, a needle in this sense. So the, entr the entrance is with a 27 gauge needle and just goes straight in to exteriorize the proline. Then he creates a flange to hold the single piece optic uh, in that position and repeats that again to the other side. 
And of course, the marking is important. I will illustrate that later to get it at 180 degree uh, position, as Dr. Noliza has highlighted. Now, he cuts off the haptics because he feels that, you know, there's a propens uh, potential for the haptics to cause some iris chaffing. So he said, you don't need the haptics, it serves no function. So he cuts them off, folds the lens and inserts it this way. So in this way, you get a two-point fixation and uh, the proline suture is then cut to appropriate length. And I'll highlight, you know, what length you need to get a nice bulb. And the lens sits inside, pretty, pretty stable and quite central. So one of the advantages here is you don't need a flap, you don't need to tie sutures, so potentially you're using a suture, but um, again, getting hopefully better fixation, but quicker. So this is a, yeah, another technique that's shown, but rather than actually uh, using uh, eye wall punch, so uh, this surgeon just passes the needle of the 6-0 straight through again where the optic haptic junction is. So this is a, a SA60 lens as they showed earlier. So it's a one piece uh, acrylic lens. And in this way, the surgeon does not truncate, the, uh, does not chop off or amputate the haptics and just inserts it. But the difference here is he uses the actual injector. So you put the sutures in, and this is a Monarch injector from Alcon and injects the, the lens in. So this is through a smaller, smaller wound, obviously. So you don't have to, have to actually uh, open up the wound to use the folding forceps. Same principles apply again. So you have the sutures in your exteriorized with the 27 gauge needle. So now this is uh, a couple of cases that I'm gonna show, which I have done. And I found that my experience is still early with this uh, because over the last, I would say a year, I've done several. And these are some of the cases that I'll be able to highlight some points. So in this case, uh, I'm using it uh, to fixate a haptic of a patient with pseudo exfoliation. So this patient has got solely exfoliation and glaucoma. So my colleague actually has done the trabeculectomy here and has created a scleral flap. And I'm coming in to actually fixate the lens. The lens doesn't look too far off this uh, subluxated in the X or Y position, but in the Z, the Z axis is actually sitting quite far down towards the vitreous cavity. So I'm starting off and I think this is one of the points that I want to highlight uh, perhaps I'm biased being a VR surgeon as well, is that you need to do a good uh, vitrectomy. Whether you do it past planar or you do it limbal, past planar is, is my preferred uh, look uh, approach um, with an AC maintainer in place using trimcinolone to highlight vitreous. Because when you're actually manipulating either the intraocular lens or sutures, you're passing needles you know, in, that, in that plane, you're going to have vitreous which you don't want to have and you don't want to pull on vitreous and subsequently cause retinal problems so make sure you clear uh, the anti uh, the vitreous uh, adequately and once you've cleared some from the back then you can come to the front and clear some of the vitreous that's presenting forward so as i said this lens is sitting more is uh, posteriorly than it should it's not quite off in the x or y axis um, I use the, this image guided system to actually mark my locations of the suture. Let's pause a little, a little while. So the first suture here is about two and a half millimeters posterior to the limbus. So what I'm doing actually is to pass this 27 gauge needle. Um, as you saw earlier, I used uh, the Kuglin hook to identify where the haptic is so that I can puncture the capsular bag uh, under the haptic and uh, coming through this way so I can create the first pass under the haptic itself. So what happens then once I've come through, I will then feed in this uh, 6-0 proline or 5-0 proline, whichever you have, it's both available, and feed it into the 27 gauge needle. It's relatively easier to handle because it's stiffer, it's thicker, not like your 9 or 10-0 proline, and then you just pull it through that way. And then what happens now, the other mark I put is about uh, one millimeter to one and a half millimeters behind the limbus. And what you're gonna, one and a half millimeters. So what you're doing now is you're gonna come through, but go above the haptic this time. So what you're essentially doing is passing a double-ended proline, going through and creating a lasso. So you're gonna catch the haptic uh, as you lassoing it to, uh, through the bag as well. So when you have the bag present, so you're not going to have that actual lasso sliding along the length of the haptic and you can 
fixate it uh, quite securely this way. So you have that uh, thread in again to this, it's a double-ended proline, and you pull through. As you see afterwards, you cut a loop coming through and you yank it a little bit harder, you see that it catches the lens. So similarly on the other side, so the pupil obviously is not well dilated in this uh, pseudo exfoliation pa uh, patient. So I put in the iris hook so I can see the haptic properly and do the same again. So what happens now again, two and a half millimeters posterior and you go under the haptic, feed in uh, another double-ended uh, proline suture, or 6 proline, bring it through as before. I just repeat the same process to lasso the other side. So I would tend to do it on both sides, unless uh, of course you've only got a subluxation that's significant on one side. But in this case, the whole lens was sitting posteriorly. So I need to actually fixate both haptics to ensure that it comes back uh, and securely into the center. So as you pull it through, um, what I found that this is probably the, I would say easy, the relatively more straightforward part. But as you see, what we need to do now you know, this is uh, one of my, this is my first case, in fact. So to find the correct length of uh, proline to actually create a good size bulb for this 27 gauge tunnel that you created into the sclera. I found that, you know, this was me starting off and I found that it got too big and I had to chop off and start again. And what is the optimum, or at least I would think something that will create an adequately sized uh, proline suture so that it will sit in the sclera without potential for eroding through the conch is about two millimeters. And one of the things I found that you need to do is you have to create some tension onto that suture because you're actually uh, trying to hold the haptic in place. So you can't have it too slack because after you put the, the bulb and you created the bulb, everything might just sag back inside because the, other, the, the inside part is not pulled taut. So as you see here, um, my colleague here is finishing off the conch closure and you get a nice coverage of the, uh, the, bulb, the bulbous ends of the proline. And the lens looks pretty secure and centered. So this is the patient on the first day and uh, two weeks after. So you've got a nice lens sitting there and the uh, pressure is pretty good after the brachylectomy. And uh, you know, the lens, of course, is still a very short follow-up. I think it's just got about four months of follow-up and uh, time, time will tell how long this lens stays in place. Now, this is the last scenario I'm moving on uh, to is basically another patient that actually, this is a patient, uh, interestingly, um, has got Marfan syndrome, which I did not elicit. I think I took a poor history, did not elicit that. And I think that's one thing that you need to, that what I've learned again, not uh, to be able to ask detailed questions. So I went into the eye, did my retractomy and was trying to just go back a little bit. I just saw this subluxated lens, the pupil won't dilate well. And when you found out she had Marfan, she said she had surgery previously. And what I found out actually, this was a lens that had been sclerofixated. So this is a CZ60BD lens. It's a PMMA lens and you can see the little eyelet there. And what happened is the suture had broken. So as had been reported, these uh, nine or 10 old proteins can break over time. And that's exactly what happened. The suture broke and the lens uh, subluxated or dislocated really. It was pretty much hanging in mid vitreous so do an anterior vitrectomy. I think the surgeon before me had done a good job. There's not much vitreous there, but I just wanted to make sure, clear away all the trimsinolone. And what I'm going to do now is to first grab that haptic so you can exteriorize it. And then I open up my central wound. I use a 2.75 wound. So in this case, I found a proline suture was what I wanted to do because if I had uh, found that it was just a standard, maybe a, a non-PMMA haptic, then I could actually explant this or chop it up but uh, you, obviously, you know, you can't cut PMMA IO walls. I've got to open a large wound to take this out. So I thought, let's try and refixate this lens because the optic looks good. She had decent vision prior to, uh, to this dislocation. So what I've done is exteriorize the haptic, remove that remnant uh, 9 or 10 proline that was in the eyelet. The eyelet was still in good, good position. So what I then try to do now is to bring forward the whole optic so that I can bring into the anterior chamber. So I just use a second instrument to lift the optic up and then use my cutter to do the same. So I can bring the whole uh, IOL into the anterior chamber. Uh, what you see here is me uh, internalizing the haptic that I've just taken out so that I can get hold of the other one and bring that one out so I can clear that eyelet and start putting my proline suture through it. 
Okay, so bimanal techniques are important because that will always give you uh, a benefit of uh, manipulations within the eye a bit easier. So you externalize that haptic and start feeding through this 6O proline. So I just put it through and what you do is get it all the way to how long you want it to be and then you use the core tree to create that little flange. So over here, it doesn't matter uh, how long how long the, the proline is, but just create enough of a flange so that it actually goes through and um, won't, won't, won't run through the eyelet. I'm making sure it's big enough so it won't do that. Now the pupil, of course, came down. I think we need a good view and a view is everything to get it done. So that's what I did. Put iris hooks in to ensure it, it's uh, big enough. Now I could do a, this is a technique described by Agawal, the handshake or hand over hand basically using two hands to bring the other haptic out so that I can then cross the proline through that. So as you see, there's a fair few, fair amount of manipulation required. So that's why you need to do a good anterior vitrectomy to ensure you can work safely in that place. So same principle again, put the proline suture and create a, a nub so that it actually uh, gets, you know, a, like a little stopper there. Mark the eyes 180 degrees in this case. 27 gauge needle and pass the other end of the proline suture into the 27 gauge so you can externalize it and you see the principle is the same basically just move along a little bit quicker coming to the end now so do the same with the other eye so be mindful of how long of the how much length of proline that you're allowing back into the eyes you see the eye well is being pushed further into the eye and what you don't want is to have such a long length of proline suture that the eye wall is dangling too near the retina uh, because you've, you obviously need to have a good vitreous clearance before you do that. So you see now once you actually tug on both, length, both uh, sutures, you get the lens quite nicely centered there. Now the issue now is to create the correct size so that you can get it flush and subconjunctivally and secure the lens uh, safely. So as I mentioned, probably around about two, maybe three millimeters with a 6O proline to get a good size nub which can actually uh, sit flush or subconjunctively without eroding through and hold the, the IOL in place. And that looks pretty good at the end of the case. So patient I've had so far about one month follow-up and this is how it looks. So you see those little blue dots there, it's still subconjunctable, it's not come through, the lens looks like it's sitting well. So the tools that we need, as I mentioned, you can use a 5 or 6 I think 6 is preferable, 5 might be a bit too big. You need the 27 gauge needle, low heat core tree, and you need those micro grasping forceps so you can actually manipulate the sutures easily. I found that, you know, I've, I've done a lot of sutureless as well. I think that was my go to technique, but this one has got a role. I find it's a versatile technique. It's not as fiddly as actually handling 10 O sutures and conventional uh, suturing. And you can do in the back IOL rescue, as I've shown with the pseudo exfoliation patient. And potentially in future, I can look forward to maybe using single piece IOLs instead of three piece if you want a patient that had a, that wants a additional function of lenses. Now maybe with the uh, ATIOLs, you know, you got the, uh, that have, you've done a PCR, can you potentially use this technique to fixate the lens? But of course you have to make sure about your biometry being accurate. And capsular tension rings or segments could be fixated this way, an anamid segment or a sutured CTR, you could use a proline to put it instead of creating those uh, complicated flaps to actually suture as well. And aridodialysis repair has already been reported using this proline sutures that actually bring through and create a flange. So as I mentioned, some points to ponder as I found uh, in my limited experience so far. The length of suture to heat to get a correct size flange is important. And holding the suture taut to get an internal flange flush against the eye wall, particularly in the second case where you actually have uh, just a, a stopper that's holding the lens rather than lassoing the haptic, which might be more secure. So time will tell. So whether this will be a, a good technique, I think it's got a role because it's more versatile and rather than just um, sutureless fixation, which you definitely need a three-piece lens for. Okay, thank you very much. I hope I didn't run over too much. And uh, do we have time for discussion or do you have to move on? Yes, yes, we have time for discussion. I think we just Great. have a yeah. quick one. Manuel, can, can I just actually um, um, just uh, ask for your opinion on this? Uh, I actually tried try to do this in the wet lab just to have, uh, you know, to have a gauge on this. Yeah. The two problems that I actually look at is actually first is the placement of that flange in the haptic. Because mm. we use a binocular eye model. Every time that we try, we can see that our 
position is different part of the haptic. You know, so yeah. there's no standard. That's one. The second one is actually remember that you said that the problem that when you do a flunge, right? Mm. Um, the one that I this is wet lab anyway, but the one that we feel is actually when we know that we have gut is actually have the feeling that we have as you go on, not only that you go in, but as the feeling as you go on, okay, this is a bit tighter, it should be okay. But that's just a feeling, nothing yeah. else. Do you have any uh, tips? No, like I said, because uh, I'm still early in that journey as well. So as I mentioned, those are the few points that I find, you know, that will be important so that we can get a good fixation. Um, like I said, like you said, actually, it's a matter of the feel of whether it's actually reach the, the point where it's actually stopping the, the lens or flush against the lens. And the other thing that I try to do is to pull both sides so that you can actually feel that it's taut against both sides and then hold the tension in that one hand, perhaps the left hand, and then take the cautery and then suture uh, and then create the flange there. So hopefully at least the left one is taut. And then when that's fixed, then the right side, then you can do the same because you've already created a taut flange on one side. Uh, that's what I have done um, with that. But it's a little bit of a blind procedure. Like you said, you don't actually see where it is. And I think that's why Kana Brava created the eye wall punch because there's a lot of variability when you're just trying to stitch the eye wall and bring the, the, the suture through the eye wall there. And do you and think the distance between the limbal actually have to be adjusted as well? Because if you put a one part too far, then it will be a stretch and be centered. Yeah. I'm just asking you. Yeah. I think the same principles of... Uh, like Yamane in the sense that you have to be the equidistance from the limbus and definitely exactly 180 degrees apart. Otherwise, you're going to end up with tilt or you know rotation of the lens. And um, if that happens, then you may have more of a problem because you have created a flange and then you've got to cut the tip off and then there's not enough suture to create a flange. Whereas in Yamane, you can internalize and you know bring it back out again. So you have to be accurate there, I would think. Thank you. Thank you, Mangwai. Great talk. Great talk. Um, Mangwai, very nice uh, techniques uh, you show. I think the gr great thing about this is that you, you are using very fairly large uh, sutures that will be very durable, uh, you know, and uh, really, I think the haptic of IOL is actually equivalent to 5O uh, polypropylene. So, you know, 6O, I think, is very close. And mm. I think I've done a few, but I think the challenge in this sort of uh, sclera, uh, suture fixation is actually to try to, first of all, centration, and then trying to really see how taut you are, you know, you you, can, you mustn't be too taut or too loose. So it's a, it's a fine judgment, I think. I, I don't know how, how do you make sure you're properly centered and how do you make sure you're not too taut or too loose, you know, what, what are the... I think like, I think the same as what Kairizan mentioned, it's really like a feel. So the way I've done it is to try and pull on both sides so that the eye well, you eyeball it and it looks centered at the same mm. time that you can feel that it's actually being pulled on either side, but not too much to one side. And then uh, holding that same amount of tension in one hand, letting go with the other and creating a flange. The other way is to, of course, you got a third hand or get an assistant to create a flange while you're holding the switch. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Mangwai, uh, what about okay. uh, uh, surgical PI? Uh, we will do uh, a PI also in this type of case to prevent uh, possible pupillary block. Over. Yeah, I think I think uh, I would. I think in the first case, the trap. I think my colleague did the PI already, and in this second one, I think uh, there was a PI, but not not obvious. I think the previous surgeon already put a PI there, so I think yeah, I would, I would do the same. Do you know where to source out the punch that you mentioned just now? Nah, that one I don't think is commercially available yet. Kana Brava is still patenting it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I it actually like I a... saw Canavara had, had another video. I think he's not advocating the punch anymore. He's he's design designing a new lens and he called it the shoe shoe yeah, string yeah. something? Shoe lace, yeah. shoe lace. Design a new lens. Designing or... a shoe lace. Yeah, yeah. But I think the punch yeah. is not very consistent. You can get a lot of tilt and different centration, you know. It's not consistent. So he's designing a shoe lace lens for to do that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, looks like a belt punch. One of the video that you showed, Manuai, is they cut. He cut the, yeah, the haptic and yeah. leaving the optic only. Don't you think that will create kind of? No, I I was thinking like the haptic may, might help in terms of uh, rotational movement of the eye uh, that prevents prevents it. So uh, I don't know if it cut the haptic, it might cause tilting along the you know. Yeah, I know uh, what you. 
So that's yeah. why I showed the other video where the guy didn't cut it. So I think there's no consent <laughs> out yet. Uh, so I think we got to wait for more publications to see the other people's yeah. wisdom. Just very early experience with this technique, I think. Okay, Sh shall we uh, move on to the next session? Yeah, I think we've got to show the sponsor videos and I'll answer some questions in the, in the Q&A box. Yeah. All right. So we will move on to the next, uh, which is actually the video sources. So the first video. What does it take to recover a vision lost? It takes a visionary. In pursuit of restoring weary eyes, clouded by the passage of time. A master with hands as steady as his resolve, moving with no sign of hesitation, nor reservation, confidently bringing a vision back to life. Orchestrated to the rhythm of an infallible trust. In a device that encapsulates quality and the promise of unparalleled brilliance. The success of a cataract surgery is nothing less than a work of art. With the perfect union of biomaterial, biomechanics, and biooptics in Acrosoft IQ IOLs, the masterpiece you create stands the test of time. Acrosoft IQ Panoptics and Acrosoft IQ Panoptics Toric IOLs are innovative trifocal lenses. They offer presbyopia correction at the time of cataract surgery, as well as optional astigmatism correction. Their advanced enlightened optical technology can help you enhance visual performance and ease post-operative patient management. Panoptics Toric IOLs let you offer that same performance to a wide range of astigmatic cataract patients. Multifocal IOLs have been shown to offer improved near and intermediate visual acuity in the presence of low levels of astigmatism. And because even 5 degrees of toric IOL rotation can cause enough clinical blur to impair functional vision, Acrosoft IQ Panoptics Toric IOLs are built on the Acrosoft IQ platform, which is proven to deliver the confidence of long-term axial and rotational stability. As the first hydrophobic trifocal lenses built on the clinically proven Acrosoft IQ platform, Acrosoft IQ Panoptics and Acrosoft IQ Panoptics Toric IOLs deliver advanced presbyopia correction for cataract patients, with and without astigmatism. But that's not all. They are also designed to enhance visual performance when and where your patients need it most. I'm going with the second video. stands for small incision lenticular extraction. It is a new addition to the laser refractive surgery treatment modality, which was first introduced by Carl Zeiss 
about 13 years ago. The first publication was actually in 2008. It is also known as Relax Smile Before, where Relax stands for Refractive Lenticular Extraction. Smile utilizes a single laser platform, which is actually a femtosecond laser, to create intrastromal keratomeliosis with minimum disruptions to the anterior portions of the cornea. This indeed is a very interesting question. Uh, usually, to explain it in simple terms, I would compare smile procedure as a laparoscopic procedure that has been done in general surgery. Smile is a keyhole procedure that attempts to achieve the same goal as conventional LASIK or PRK. There are obvious advantages structurally when you perform a small incision procedure. At the same time, the precaution indication and safety margin will remain the same. There are definite advantages and disadvantages with small incision surgery. To the patient, I would still advise them to take necessary precautions and counsel them like any other laser refractive surgery modality. To my colleague, I would advise them not to venture outside the safety margin, though smile have the definite structural stability advantage when compared to lacing. This is a very popular question and everybody keep asking us this question. Interesting enough, this simple and direct question can have various answers depending on who we ask. I would like to take an approach of saying that each of the laser refractive procedure modality, SMILE, LASIK and PRK has their own strength and point for improvement. There are many published papers available nowadays about the performance of SMILE in comparison to LASIK and PRK. The landmark study would be the FDA study that concluded SMILE is both safe and effective in correcting myopia. There are multiple testimonials from both patients and surgeons about the pros and cons of each treatment modalities. As for me, based on the global data and my personal experience, the addition of SMILE to our refractive armamentarium has brought many positive developments. I think in the future, SMILE procedure will continue to stay as one of the main treatment modality in laser refractive surgery. It is also expected to come with many more improvement and refinement in its application to produce a better outcome. We will continue to discover both the strength and to hear new techniques to overcome the current gap that exists in the current procedure. Hi, welcome back. So we will proceed to our next uh, session. It is the Suchilis IOL fixation segment. So I will introduce our next speaker, Dr. Chung Yin Yao. He will be speaking on intraspheral IOL fixation. Dr. Chung is a senior consultant uh, ophthalmologist and senior cornea and refractive surgeon in, with special interest with complex cataract surgery. Uh, he's actively involved in teaching of master students and one of the most humble doctors you can find. So welcome, Dr. Chung. Are you muted? Sorry, sorry, where am I now? Um, I don't see anything uh, suddenly, suddenly. Yeah, we can see your you can see your presentation though. Yeah, but I can't see anything. I see the zoom money. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, wait, wait, wait. One second. No, not this one. Maybe you unshare and share again. Um, how do I see the whole screen? I'm seeing a bar now only. Nothing that I can see here. Can you unshare your screen and try again? Uh, never mind. I think I'll just. You can see me, right? You can see my 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 screen. Ah, uh, now I can see it now. Okay. So you I try again. Share now? the screen again. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Okay, I just see my screen now. Uh, are you all seeing my screen now? Yes. Okay, that's good. That's good. So, uh, hi, Jane Bond. Thank you for your introduction and uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Today, my presentation is on intrascalar fixation of IOL. And uh, this is my financial disclosure. Okay. Now, uh, we all know that the incidence of uh, IOL subluxation is on the rise for many reasons. The, uh, there's a paper published, a review paper published by Francisco in uh, 2015, showing that uh, many patients has the up to 0.1% of uh, this uh, lens may be subluxated after 10 years from the initial surgery, and uh, up to 1.7% of the lens may be subluxated after 25 years from the initial cataract surgery. And the second most common cause for uh, IOL to be dislocated or subluxated is the complication during the initial surgery, especially during phaco emulsification. Uh, then the other common causes published in this paper are the trauma and pseudo exfoliation. Now, I believe the management of uh, a subluxated IOL begins from the slit lamp evaluation. Okay. Now, um, I will examine the eye uh, under the slit lamp to evaluate the capsular bag uh, properly, especially if the dislocated or subluxation is only involving the lens uh, and not the IOL capsular uh, complex. So if only the IOL is subluxated, then I will have a good look to try to figure out whether the anterior capsule bag is still intact. If the anterior capsule bag is intact, then likely that I can still uh, uh, implant a three-piece IOL either in the sulcus with or without the uh, 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 anterior CCC uh, capture. And also, I also want to have a good guess of the IOL material by looking at the lens to try to figure out whether this is a foldable lens or a rigid PMMA uh, lens. Because uh, this, will, this will prepare myself in creating the wound in doing the procedure. If it's a foldable IOL, then likely that I'll just do a, a corneal incision to expand the lens and also do the uh, secondary IOL implantation. If it's a rigid PMMA, I will do a scalar tunnel uh, incision to uh, expand the lens uh, because this is a, a procedure, this wound will create less uh, surgical induced astigmatism for better outcome. I also wanted to try to find out whether this is uh, the, the subluxated lens, is a monofocal lens, whether it's a toric lens or a multifocal lens. This is also important because uh, usually I will find out from the patient whether the patient actually can see well before the lens was subluxated. If the patient can see well and happy with the outcome and the patient has a toric or multifocal I will implanted earlier, then I have to explain to the patient to give the patient a realistic expectation so that uh, after the surgery, likely the patient will need to wear glasses in order to see well, not unlike before where they can actually see well without uh, glasses. Because uh, when it comes to secondary implantation, uh, I personally will mostly implant a monofocal uh, IOL rather than uh, a toric or multifocal uh, implant. And also, also important to find out from the patient whether the, the subluxated eye can see well for distant or can see well for near before this incident happened. Because, uh, you know, if the patient said that I can see near well uh, without glasses, then what I will do is I'll implant a monofocal that will aim to about minus 1.5 to about minus 2. 
uh, uh, so that patient, patient will have the same kind of uh, a respective outcome uh, after the surgery. Now, the advantages of a uh, scalar fixation of IOL, uh, 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 it has this kind of uh, advantages whereby it rests at the natural anatomy of the crystalline lens. It doesn't cause any damage to the anterior chamber angle. It doesn't cause distortion of the pupil. And again, it's distant away from the cornea. So it has less chances of causing uh, endo any, any cornea endothelial cell damage in the long run. The disadvantage of the, uh, um, I, uh, this uh, scale fixation uh, uh, include reverse pupillary blocks, such as uh, shown up in this picture. The, either the optic one or the part of the optic come, uh, came out from the uh, 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 posteriorly, or sometimes uh, you can also see uh, the whole optic come forward to the anterior chamber through the pupil, despite having a, a PI done. So in this style of case, if it happens again after reposition of the optic, I may create another PI for this patient. A UGH syndrome can happen if you position the lens uh, optics too anteriorly. Cystic macular edema can happen. And of course, the techniques are slightly more challenging to learn with a slightly uh, 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 steeper learning curve as well. Now, I have, I have uh, uh, developed two kind of techniques in uh, performing scale fixation, depending on the type of haptics. If the haptic is made of PMMA, then I'll do the scale slip cut with tunnel. If the haptic is made of PVDF, then I'll perform Yamani style intrascara fixation. I think the reason is obvious because um, if you look at the Yamani uh, technique in performing the scale fixation, it involves a lot of uh, very excessive uh, manipulation of the haptic, especially at the optic haptic junction. Okay, so if this is a PVD, PMMA, look at this PV, uh, PMMA haptics, easily we can deform the uh, lens at the optic haptic junction. And if the haptic is being excessively manipulated, it will be king or cook good uh, after the uh, maneuver. So this will definitely lead to tilting of the uh, optics. Whereas compared to PVDF haptic, you can see despite, uh, start again, despite excessive manipulation of the, the haptics, Okay, at the optic haptic junction or the haptic itself, the haptics uh, are very flexible and uh, with very good memory. That's why this is the go to lens if you wanted to do the Yamani style kind of uh, technique in doing the scale fixation. I'd like to share with you my video on a slip cut with tunnel scale fixation uh, using a three piece IOL with a PMMA haptics. Okay, now this. Uh, to begin with, I mark uh, two mark on the cornea, 180 degrees away from each other. Uh, this is the site for anchoring the haptic. Then after a periotomy on both sides, uh, I will make a scleotomy mark two millimeter away from the uh, limbus. Then this is where uh, something new to some of you. I will make a, using a 15 degree blade, make a two millimeter in length and two third in depth uh, uh, scalar slit parallel to the limbus, okay? Mark, cut it towards the uh, sclerotomy. You do this thing, it is in both sides. And then a 25G, uh, this uh, a 30G, sorry, 30G needle is bent. And this needle is used to make a tunnel at the end of the sclera. Again, along the limbus, uh, you create a tunnel that is about two to three millimeter in length. Using the same 15 degree blade, I make parasynthesis, corneal wound, and another parasynthesis at the site that marked earlier for the uh, anchoring of the haptic. Then you can either put in a choker, a 25, I'm using a 25G choker here, or a AC maintainer um, for infusion. You probably need infusion uh, sometimes along the surgery to firm up the eye, okay, for. Uh, your manipulation of your uh, surgery. Then the anterior chamber is entered and uh, viscoelastic is injected into the anterior chamber to maintain the AC. 
Now, until this level, I my my AC maintainer is not turned on yet. Okay, so the this is a subluxated uh, IQ lens, so it's retrieved and then we position into the anterior chamber. Okay, and then uh, I just now I make use a two point four keratome, so I have to enlarge this uh, this wound, this this corneal wound slightly larger to about 2.75 or 3 millimeter. And then using a reverse Sinsky hook, I hook up the haptic, support the haptic with a corneal forcep. Then using a St. Martin, um, go in and at the optic haptic junction, firmly grasp the optic and pull the lens out. Then followed by implanting a three-piece IOL that's come with a PMMA haptics. Okay, I will implant the IOL into the anterior chamber. And then I will actually rotate the lens and make both the haptics into the anterior chamber as well and position the haptic is in such a manner. Then using a band a 25G needle to create a sclerotomy. Again, I test check the, the, the IOP of the eye first. If soft, then I turn on the infusion until it's firm for, for this uh, kind of maneuver to, 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 to perform. Then I bend two uh, micro forcep, uh, serrated tip micro forcep. One is a 23G forcep. And then this is blue one is a 25G forcep. Then the 25G forcep is used to enter the sclerotomy. And a 23G micro forcep go through the uh, parasynthesis to catch the haptics. And the objective here is trying to catch the tip of the haptics and externalize the haptic. So um, when doing this maneuver, because the IOL is you know, at the planar position, you must try not to tilt your uh, forcep to pull out the, or to externalize the haptic. You should pull the, the haptic out horizontally in order not to uh, cause any distortion on at the uh, optic haptic junction. A similar step is performed to capture the other haptic on the other side. So in a handshake manner, one, have one uh, micro forcep capture the haptic, the other one try to capture the, the tip to fit it into the other micro forcep, and then you pull it out gradually in a control fashion. Um, this, this, this eye has a very small pupil, so there's a little bit more minute a manipulation on the optics and trying to push it into behind the, the pupil. When you bring up the haptic, try to uh, uh, bring it up in a very controlled fashion, slowly, horizontally, so that you don't suddenly pull the whole haptic out too far out, okay? Otherwise, the other end may get pulled into the eye again. Then you have to repeat this procedure on the other side. So as long as you pull up in a gradual fashion, this haptic will remain stable. And then next step is to uh, tuck the haptic into this uh, the tunnel that you have created earlier, okay, on both sides. So how much to, to uh, uh, tuck in depends on the centration of the optics. So this, uh, this uh, method is very easy in terms of centering the, the, uh, the optics, okay? So you can either suture this uh, slit wound or you can just leave the slit wound uh, uh, like this the lens is actually very stable. I have cases that done more than 10 years without any uh, problem. Uh, in this case, this is a post retractomized ISO. I, I only do a, a PI at the end of procedure surgically, and then I close up the wound. So this is the appearance of the eye at the end of the surgery, okay? So this is how a uh, sleep cut with tunnel scale fixation is done. Next, I'm going to show you um, um, if these three piece LL come with a PVBF haptic, I will prefer to do a Yamani style uh, scale fixation uh, technique. So, again, uh, a troca is uh, uh, inserted for infusion. After creating all the wound, the subluxated LL is retrieved and then we position into the anterior chamber. Okay, again, same, same, same tactic pull out the, uh, the uh, haptic from the, uh, from the corneal wound, catch, 
capture the uh, support the haptic with one hand and another hand use a St. Martin forcep, get into the uh, go into the eye, catch the optic haptic at the optic junction, firmly on the optic, pull the uh, IOL out from the wound directly, then followed by uh, anterior retractomy and using a retractor to make a, a PI as well at the same time. Okay, then I'll mark the eye again, 180 degree to each other. This is just to mark on the cornea to, to give you a precision way. You want to do the sclerotomy. Sclerotomy is two millimeter away from the limbus. And then uh, a three piece IOL with a PVDF haptics is now uh, implanted into the anterior chamber. And in Yamani technique, he placed the haptic outside. Okay, but for me, I will rotate the haptic into the eye. Okay. And I'm here to show you how I actually do uh, my way of doing this procedure. Okay, after this, um, you can either close up the wound, then you don't have to use the infusion so often. If you do not close up the wound, then there's the time you need the infusion. So right now, I'm going to use a band 27 G needle trying to enter into the eye. As you can see, the eye is soft. So I have to turn on the infusion to firm up the eye first before I see the eye is firm, eyeball is firm before I at once further into the eye, okay? So now I will use a, a 23G micro forceps, go through the scale, uh, go through the parasynthesis, catch the haptics and try to feed this uh, haptic, the first haptic into the hub of the uh, 27G uh, needle. Um, this, step, this step is the, the, to, to, to uh, slide the first haptic into the hub of the uh, needle actually is not too difficult. Uh, the second uh, haptic is more difficult. So you can either push your needle or, or, or pull the haptic into the hub of the needle. And then uh, you gently, again, in a horizontal manner, uh, externalize the needle and the haptic as, at the same time. Okay. So when you're externalizing it, you, once you see the haptic, support the haptic with your tying forcep and then cauterize it. Uh, with a thermal cautery. You do not have to make a very large uh, flange here. Okay, The same maneuver go to the other side uh, uh, in, to catch, to, to retrieve the, uh, the haptics. Okay? A 27G needle go into the eye and then uh, uh, micro forceps through the parasynthesis. catch the haptic and then we try to feed the haptic into the needle hub. This, this, this hap, the second haptic is actually more difficult. Now, as you can see, the, 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 the manipulation is not too much, but what you actually do not see is the distortion and conformation at optic haptic junction here, okay? So if this is a PVDF haptic, likely the the, the, there will be a, a distortion and lead to a lens uh, tube. So once the habit is externalized, then it's uh, cauterized to form a flange and both end uh, push down to the sclerotomy. And uh, centration of the optic is then checked. And uh, if it's well, then that will be the end of the procedure. So, this is how it looks like at the end of the surgery. The pupil doesn't look very round because uh, I accidentally cut the pupil uh, with the anterior rejectum, reject, rejector during the rejectomy. Okay. Now I'm showing the next video to show you in Yamani, uh, this uh, modified Yamani technique. After I push in the both end of the, uh, the uh, haptic, then I, I feel that the lens wasn't actually uh, in a very uh, central position. So this is what I'm trying to show you, how we can actually modify and adjust the, the haptic. I, one of the haptic, I retrieve it, pull it out, and then I chop off the flange, okay? Then using a reverse Sinsky hook, I try to pull the, I pull the haptic back into the eye, and then I try to, uh, actually I try to uh, uh, make the happy into AC, but couldn't make it, so I just leave it there. Uh, 
Uh, again, 27 June needle entering the scale at a different uh, uh, spots. And I try to uh, catch the haptic again. I have to use the needle to pull the haptic, or push the haptic optic away in order to see the haptic. As you can see, there's a lot of distortion at optic haptic junction here. But this is a PVDF, so it can withstand this kind of pressure. So the haptic is now uh, pushed in, slide into the, the, the needle. And now the, the, uh, the haptic is, uh, is then externalized. So as you can see, I try to externalize in a horizontal manner. Okay, I don't lift up the needle. So once externalized, again, cauterize it to form a, a flange and then reposition the, uh, the haptic into the scara. So now you can see, you know, uh, if you want to compare, this is before and after, then you actually can see that the optic is being adjusted and now it's more center compared to uh, before the uh, adjustment. So uh, in summary, I will perform slip cut with tunnel scale fixation if the uh, haptic is made of PMMA because uh, this, this is a technique that is more gentle to the haptic and also the optic haptic junction. If, uh, if, the, if, the, if, the PM, if the haptic is made of PVDF, then I definitely will perform a Yamani style scale fixation because uh, I find that this is a less invasive uh, technique. Anyway, both techniques uh, appears to me uh, um, has a learning curve, but not actually too difficult to learn. Okay, the advantages of both techniques are that uh, uh, it uses more incision, so you can use foldable IOL, and, uh, and 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 this will lead to a more predictable uh, refractive outcome. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Uh, I think we move on to the next sponsor video first. Then we will go on with Prof. Musha's uh, presentation. Then we'll come to a discussion at the end of the whole thing. Okay, so... Hold on, yeah. So this is the next video.
All right. So we will move on to our next uh, talk. It will be Modified Yamane Technique by Prof. Mosha. Uh, Prof. Mosha is one of the retinal surgeons in UKM. She's also visiting a uh, surgeon in KPJ, Center for Sight, and also for Tony. So let's welcome Prof. Mosha. Thank you, Jambon. Um, because I have uh, many videos to share and to keep track, I mean, to keep within the time frame, I actually prepared a video for this. Uh, just let me run this. Uh, thank you to the organizer for having me here. Uh, we have seen how Dr. Chun demonstrated all the nice and perfect way of doing your money. So I'll be sharing the modified techniques when things are not perfect. So the, the perfect Yamane technique requires a perfect combination of instruments uh, with or without a good assistant. But if we are lacking in one of it, we can still do the surgery, of course, but with a bit of modification. So in other words, when do we need to use the modified technique? Uh, probably when we don't have the perfect set of instruments. Uh, if we encounter difficulties, especially during our first few cases, uh, and when the surgery is uh, not a straightforward surgery and probably a combined kind of surgery. So before I proceed further, allow me to highlight the needle issue and also double pertaining to the double needling technique, which was suggested by Mr. Yamane. So the 30 gauge thin wall needle has a larger lumen compared to the standard needle. So in our center, we have to bring it in from Singapore and yet we still haven't received it until now. Um, and we are still make do of our standard 27 gauge needle, uh, which is probably the closest in size compared to the 30 gauge thin wall needle. So as we can see, although the figure is seems like more or less the same, but bear in mind the 27 gauge standard needle is actually still bigger in size uh, in terms of the inner diameter, inner diameter as well as the outer diameter. Now, let's look at one of the YouTube video. Um, this is a double needling technique. The surgeon was using the 30 gauge needle, engaging both haptics at the same time and externalizing it concurrently. So, uh, we were using a 27 gauge needle. So we were trying to simulate the same uh, technique. Uh, we attempt, attempted it a couple of times and we end up getting the same problem over and over again. Um, either we lose one end of the haptic uh, or we end up having a bit of ballooning of the conjunctiva, so um, and 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 end up having to dissect the conjunctiva to assess the uh, haptic underneath. So, in conclusion, we think that you no, know, if we, you are using the twenty-seven gauge needle, uh, probably it's not the optimum needle to use for this particular technique, and probably the best way is if we externalize the haptic individually rather than the double needling technique for the 27 gauge needle. So let's go through in detail of the various techniques. Uh, this will be an overview of my discussion today. So we'll be looking at how to deal with the leading haptic first technique. And there was another technique proposed by Dr. Brian Kim to externalize the trailing haptic first. And there's also a way to externalize the haptic by using a trocar. And finally, we'll look at some of the special condition whereby we'll probably be using some mix and match technique. Now, let's look at how we deal with the leading haptic. Uh, before we go into more detailed description, let us look at one important factor which will determine the technique that we're going to use, uh, which is the type of injector. So I did not realize it is important in this technique until we try a few lenses. So basically, we have two types of injector for the PVDF haptic. IOL. So we have the screw injector by uh, Kazai, the EC3, and we also have the single hand injector from Kowa and Biotech. So obviously the screw injector requires two hands for the incision of lens, uh, whereas the single hand injector allow us to have one hand free uh, during the step. So why is this, inject is this injector seems to be important? Uh, we analyze most videos in the YouTube. So if you want to insert the haptic directly into the needle, which I call it as a one-step technique, uh, we need to do the injection of IOL with one hand and hold the needle in position with the other hand. So it sounds like you are only using two hands. Uh, this could be true if you are actually using a single hand injector. Um, but what if you have to use a screw type of injector? So we will be using both hands to inject the lens 
and obviously now we need a third hand to help to hold the needle in position so again we can do this if you have a reliable assistant uh, he or she can either hold the needle in place for us or help the screw in the IOL uh, but then what happens if you don't have the assistant all the time? So we have a various options. So if we happen to have a screw type of injector with a good assistant, uh, probably we can do the single step injecting technique. Uh, but without a good assistant, maybe we might need to consider to park the lens somewhere in the eye as step number one, then only thread in the haptic into the needle as step number two. So for me, I am not fortunate to have an assistant all the time. So I always prefer to do the one-step technique. Uh, but then I will opt for the single-hand injector. I think it's more of the surgeon preference. Uh, you can use any type of injector as long as you're aware that we might need to adjust uh, some of our technique of incision at the beginning. Now, so if we decided to part the haptic in the lens, so we can either place it behind the iris or we can place it anterior to the iris. So let's look at this uh, particular video. Uh, the surgeon choose to inject the lens behind the iris. Uh, one of the reasons why some surgeons like to do this is because you will have more space uh, to manipulate the lens. And then be careful that we need to ensure that the trailing haptic is always outside the eye so that we will not drop the lens inside the eye. Then only we will create create the canal, uh, sorry, create the tun tunnel and uh, using a forcep to trade in the haptic into the needle. So that is one way of doing it. Another way is by uh, placing the IOL in the anterior chamber. Uh, I prefer to do it this way, whereby you inject the lens uh, in front of the iris, park it at the angle. Of course, you can do this if you have a normal angle and uh, reposition it so that you can have access of the haptic and then only using a forceps to uh, trade in the needle uh, personally i have a few concerns with the retropopular injection because uh, as we know we will be working within the anterior hyoid area so potentially it might cause traction on the retina uh, viewing can be quite challenging at times, not because not only because it is behind the iris, but also it might be beyond the focal point of the microscope. And lastly, we might drop it down if we are not careful enough to hold the uh, training habit. So uh, I do feel that placing the lens in front of the iris is a safer technique to, to, to do. Now, um, let's look at other techniques. Now, the other technique was popularized by Dr. Brian Kim. So we'll be externalizing the training haptic first before the leading haptic. So uh, just to make a comparison, this is when you externalize leading haptic, you get the first haptic out. And then only you deal with trailing haptic. Uh, another way uh, to do it is by keeping the leading haptic outside the eye first. Settle the trailing haptic. And then only you uh, secure the leading haptic. So let's, let's go through the technique. Uh, this is a case of a post retractomized eye. This was uh, after removal of oil and uh, and we decided to insert the square fixated lens. So uh, we create a paracetesis 180 degree away from the main wound and using a forceps pulling out the uh, haptic, park it outside and then using the forceps to trade in the trading haptic. And then once we have uh, secured the trailing haptic, then only we create the tunnel for the second haptic. Now push back the leading haptic inside and then trade it into the needle. So in general, this step probably gives more space and suitable for PMMA haptic as it gives a bit more uh, space by keeping both haptic outside the eye because uh, I think this, this technique was popularized by Dr. Brian Kim because he feels that dealing with training haptic is quite tricky. So might as well, you know, uh, he tried to sort of manipulate and see whether there's a better way of dealing with it. And number two, uh, 
in the initial step of uh, I mean during when we first uh, learned to do the Yamane you know some surgeon was actually using the PMME haptic which is quite rigid so this is one of the technique uh, which I think is uh, give a bit more space for us mm -hmm. to deal with the probably the rigid haptic the PMME uh, initially, I thought I will not repeat this uh, technique in other cases because I still find the leading haptic first is much more easier to do. Um, but interestingly, uh, recently we had a case, uh, this is a complicated cataract surgery, uh, which was one of the training case. The lens was actually placed in a sulcus, but at the same time, there was a significant amount of peripheral cortex inside the remaining bag. So, and at the same time, you can see the IOL is actually sublicated mm -hmm. inferiorly. Mm -hmm. So we go in again, and in this particular, mm -hmm. particular case, we have to do two things. So one is to clean up the remaining uh, cortex, and number two is to uh, fixate the sublicated IOL. So we decided to use the same lens, and hopefully we do not need to extend the corneal wound. Uh, so what we did is, uh, first thing first, we have to bring both haptics into the anterior chamber. So we did that by using the uh, viscous elastic. As you can see, I'm creating another parasynthesis uh, opposite to the main wound. So we bring out the uh, both haptics into the anterior chamber. And then the externalize the leading haptic to the limbal wound. and proceed with cleaning up the remaining cortex as well as the remaining vitreous. So we did the limited anterior protectomy in this particular case. So once we are done, um, we proceed with uh, creating the tunnel for the trailing haptic. So in this particular case, we decided to use the trailing haptic first. So, um, With a forcep, grasp the uh, haptic and thread it into the uh, needle. Uh, Cauterize the haptic and proceed with the externalizing the leading haptic. You know, as you can see, I keep injecting the viscoelastic because uh, every time before you start to manipulate the eye, uh, we always need to make sure the eye trigger is good so that you will not get into trouble. Uh, doing the manipulation inside the eye. So we are pushing back the leading haptic inside using the handshake technique, then passing one uh, passing the haptic from one hap from one forcep to the other and uh, threading in the uh, leading haptic to the needle and externalize it safely. So I suppose um, it is a nice alternative technique, especially if you end up having this kind of cases. So, um, I love this technique in this particular case, and so I'm glad I did the technique, so I don't have to uh, ex explore the lens and, and created uh, another bigger wound. Now, let's look at another technique. Uh, this time, we'll be using a troca. Uh, just to share that troca is actually available as a loose item. So, uh, we don't really have to buy the big bulk of the vitrectomy set to get the access of the troca, so we can just buy the troca. Um, and now, uh, let's look at another way of, of externalizing the haptic by using the troca. For example, in this particular case, it was a case of dislodged as IOL, and after completing the vitrectomy, we proceed with injecting the lens into the eye, so I decided not to create another extra wound. Uh, since the troca is already inside, might as well use it uh, for the tunnel. So by using a Medscape forcep, we grasp the leading haptic inside the eye while injecting the lens and again, uh, still keeping the training haptic outside. Slowly retract the troca while keeping the forceps inside the eye. And once the troca is off, we slowly externalize the haptic and cauterize it. So the beauty of this technique, uh, it is very simple, uh, good control of the uh, procedure and but of course um, I have to create another wound for the uh, training haptic. Uh, another beauty thing about this procedure is we are able to um, 
you know uh, we don't have to dissect conjunctiva so um, no cutting is needed so we can still use it as a transcleral fixation of IOL without the need to cut down the uh, conjunctiva now I find it also useful to use the same technique in case we have a situation whereby the haptic uh, is dislodged especially after we have created a flange uh, occasionally we might end up with this situation especially in the first few cases um, expect that might happen so at least we know what to do um, sometimes when we are externalizing the second haptic in case we have you know created a flange for the first haptic we might sort of probably accidentally uh, give too much of uh, uh, force that causes the initial haptic to dislodge inside the eye so again we are using a trocar because if you can imagine when you already have a flange you cannot sort of thread in the haptic uh, to the needle easily so you know this is one of the technique manually grasp the haptic and with the conjunctival forcep, remove the haptic by leaving the forcep still inside the eye, then only externalize it, then cauterize it. Again, uh, we're able to do it without having need to dissect the conjunctival. So this uh, was a case referred to us for failed externalization of the second haptic. Um, as we can see, patient patient was not cooperative according to the surgeon during the first surgery. So when we received the case, the apparently the IOL was anchored nicely on one end and the other haptic was actually dangling in the vitreous cavity. So in order to correct this, we need to gain access of the dangling haptic, bring it back to the anterior chamber. So um, but then the anchored haptic is stuck in nicely in the scleral bed. So what we need to do is we need to partially dissect the conjunctival, uh, sorry, partially dissect the sclera to gain access of the dangling haptic. Um, so we slowly bring up the intraocular lens back into the anterior chamber. Uh, this one, uh, because the flange, the, the, the haptic was not yet uh, uh, cauterized, the dangling haptic was still a clean haptic with no flange so we managed to bring it up to the anterior chamber and uh, just by using a needle uh, we were able to uh, externalize the haptic safely so looking back on the hindsight i think probably in this particular case what actually happened is uh, the initial the initial externalized haptic was stuck in too early maybe uh, probably even before the externalization of the second haptic because ideally the best thing to do is to keep both haptic loose uh, and, and make sure that leading haptic is outside the eye uh, even after we have created the flange yeah? and only after we have externalized both haptics outside the eye then we secure both flange underneath the scleral bed so or within the scleral bed so one of the reasons why what happened in this particular case because the first haptic was fixed uh, at the beginning of the surgery there will be a very much limited space uh, for the surgeon to maneuver the second haptic and to externalize it safely so probably that was what happened in this particular case And this is just to highlight the importance of proper measurement or else you might end up with slightly misaligned optic as such as in this case. You know, ideally it should be on this one end should be here, the other end should probably be here. So this was what was a bit uh, misaligned so the optic uh, appeared to be slightly uh, off-centered. Uh, another uh, case whereby uh, I think what happened in this particular case is one haptic is probably measured at two millimeter and the other haptic probably measured at 1.5 or 3 so that also will end up having an apparent kind of um, longer haptic in one side so in this particular case uh, we have to cut off uh, tip of the haptic so that it shorten a bit uh, just to get the optic uh, centrally uh, positioned so sometimes some of these uh, kind of cases 
uh, will end up in, in such a way. So at least we know what to do if we encounter those kind of uh, situations. So this is what Mr. Yamane has actually written in one of his paper. The technique is simple but not easy. Uh, but the good thing is the learning curve is not steep. So thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, so can we invite everyone in and then we shall have the discussion? Well, lovely. Lots and lots of videos. You, you deal with all the problems, right, that everybody tried to, to do and then after that, just throw in your lap. Yeah. <laughs> no, the good thing is because we try to discourage our, in our center, we try to discourage ACIOL, you I know. Uh, so even in my team, we don't use ACIOL for the past three years, I think at least. So... You know, we were trying to train a lot of uh, all these junior specialists. So I think it's a good technique and everybody can do it. Oh, that's good. And it's I doable. Think, yeah. I think because I think we, as VR surgeons probably as well, I think we take out enough ACL. I don't know about you. I take out enough ACL. I agree. I agree. I, agree. Oh. I did take out for CMO. One of the cases I did offer to the patient when yeah. they have a chronic CMO. I think it's worthwhile to, to, to give it a try. Okay. Oh, any Musha, um, Prof. Musha, can I ask you a question? Uh, yes, I, yes. Yeah, the troca assisted one is quite interesting but actually the toca the size is is it 25 gauge is it <laughs> so i was just uh, wondering how you can uh is, is, is the tunnel may be too big to, to for the, uh, it is a 25 gauge yeah. it is 25 gauge of the dentist but apparently yeah. if you are just maneuver the second haptic in which you don't have to manipulate so much in the eye uh, most uh -huh. of the time it, 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 it just sit in nicely but I remember one of the articles saying that if you want to use a 25 gauge, you might need to cauterize and make a, make a bigger flange, maybe yeah. more than 0 0.4, 0 0.5. I think that is a key thing. The, the problem in Malaysia, we do not have the 27 gauge uh, troca as a loose item, unless you mm -hmm. buy in a whole pack of the vitrectomy. So mm -hmm. uh, that was the reason why I opt for the 25 gauge in this particular case, because that's the only loose item that we have at that point. But, but it's doable. Right? It's doable, it's doable. Yeah. Okay. You just have to create a, a bigger flange, probably more than 0.4 or 0.5 size. And when you are that. doing the, the, the other haptic, when, when it's not so much tension or stretch, yeah. So far, it seems to hold on. Yeah. Uh, if it, it dropped down, then I think probably you just have to repeat that again. And it's not that difficult. I find it, it is more control rather than using the needle. Mm. I have a question for everyone, actually. Um, for the lens that you all use, the PVDF one, is there a difference in the brand you use, meaning when you do the uh, flange technique, do you see a difference in the um, how it burns actually? Uh, we have yet to look at our result of the visual visual acuity long term result, but then during the surgery itself, I feel that every all the PVDF haptic lenses behave almost equal. The only thing that is important is the type of injector that we use. Uh, I've yet to use the Kowa single injector preloaded. So probably hopefully on the next session, we, I will probably use that one because it looks much more easier to use. Uh, surgical wise, I think it's more or less the same. So as long as you're aware which injector that you're using, then you can modify your technique accordingly. I think you can get YY to comment. I think he's used a few Kowa. Mm. Yeah. Okay. What I mean actually is when you burn the flange, right, it becomes like a mushroom shape. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember someone presented if you use some particular brand that actually won't turn to a mushroom shape. Ah, uh, I've used it. I've used the Carl Zeiss EC3. Okay. It, yeah. it French quite nicely. Yeah. The Biotech also is quite nice. I think Kowa is also French out quite nicely. Um, I'm not sure Dr. which Chung, you want is to that. say something is muted. <laughs> if you if you use a PMMA, it will form like a clump like that, a bulb. Uh. If you use a PVDF, it will be like mushroom. So whether it is, I think whichever brand, I think the configuration of the flange are almost the same. So the PVDF, usually they are like a mushroom. The uh, PMMA is like a bulb. Okay. What are the brands available in PVDF now in Malaysia? Oh, Chinese? now we have a lot already. We used oh. to be having problem in getting the PVDF haptic. Now you can get uh, from iCrew, one of the brands called iCrew. The other one is from Koa. Koa is interesting because it's a it's a preloaded, and the lens come out horizontal manner. You don't have to twist and turn. Unlike any other type of three piece IOL, you know, 
three weeks out is not popular because you it's not easy for especially the beginner to use. For those who have not, uh, you know, uh, who, who know about this, you know that previously when we, we convert from, uh, you know, when we start using the three piece LL, quite a number of cases we have seen, you have done a nice catechal emulsification. Then when you implant the lens, the haptic rupture the posterior capsule because of the way how the, the lens came out, okay? So this Kowa 3 single piece is very interesting because it came out, it's preloaded. You can use one hand to inject the lens. It come in a horizontal manner. The whole haptic and the optic come out in a horizontal manner. So you do not have to twist and turn of your, the injector. Mm. Mm. Can I ask a question? Sir? I saw the video for Dr. Musha and I think Dr. Wawai earlier. <clears throat> the micro forceps that you use, Dr. Musha, it looks longer. Is it a retinal forceps that you're using or? It is a retinal forcep. It's a yep. 25 gauge uh, max grip forcep. Yep. Um, um, yeah, yeah, but it's, 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 it's straight. Just, yeah. It's straight. Yeah, yeah. I think for, I think Dr. Wawai did actually bend a bit yeah. to make yeah. it easier. Yeah. So I use, my, I use the Alcon Grease by Grease, Grease, uh, what do you call it? Grease Harbor. Grease Harbor uh, yep. forcep 23G and 25G. Because of yep. the way I actually uh, enter into the eye and the way I pull out, so I actually bend the haptic. I, you don't use the instrument to bend it because if you use the instrument to bend it, the bend, the bend side will be very acute. So you may spoil the the uh, the function of the uh, uh, forcep. So you use your finger to bend it so that it's a nice curve, and you bend it about thirty to forty degree. Yep. Is, it, is it a single use? Supposed to be single use, yes. Uh, Supposed. Yeah. I wonder you can oh, bend I, it. Uh, but my, 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 my point is this. Actually, um, I used to use this Duet Forcep with 20G and 25G, and now we have 27. They are, they are much easier. But when I went to the center when they don't have it, the whole thing changed for me. The whole thing changed for me. I am just want to put it up there. I, I just, you know, it's just so long that I have to maneuver it differently. So um, I, I think it's, um, at least for me, it's a bit difficult when you use a retinal thing. Um, and I don't want to get into hair with my uh, vitro retinal colleague as well by damaging their forcep. So, yeah. But, but is it, is this possible that the proper is? It is. And it's not that expensive. So I think you can just ban it and buy another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it is. It is. That's why uh, when I went to another places, I will actually ask for that. What did you have? If, let's say, you have retinal, then I know that what needs to be done. Uh, if not, that's why the trailing haptic uh, came in. When you actually have that long thing, you want to come in, it's very difficult, at least for me. Okay, thank you. Okay. Musha, I just want to ask you, the troca assisted uh, Yamane is very interesting. Uh, uh, at the end, the IOL will be placed, I mean, it will be fixed at the at the troca side? That yeah, way? yes, yes, supposedly. Yeah, but of course you don't you don't put it at, at the usual what we do with retractor me, our trocar is about three to four millimeter behind the limbus. Mm -hmm. But if we intend to do this, I think we just have to move the oh, wait, uh, position, yes, correct, at two, two millimeter, correct. Okay. Hmm. But I agree with Dr. Chung, the koa lens is very, um, very nice to use. I must say that. Can I ask the Jung uh, question? Uh, two questions actually. One, uh, your slit uh, technique of uh, anchoring the lens, you don't need uh, glue, isn't it? You can oh, just no. No suture. Need to glue. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a very good technique because glue is so expensive, isn't it? I don't have to use Yeah. The other question I want to ask you is, you know, you 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 your your lens wasn't very centered, and then you actually went. Uh, uh, the the last one in the the last case you were showing, you actually went re. We, we do, actually uh, cut we off the it. tip, yeah, and then uh, take it out, mm. take it out and, and re can re dock it, isn't it? Yes. Could could you have uh, sort of uh, take out the other end, but actually just just shorten it? You know, uh, just, I, just I try to do it this, this in this particular case. I try to externalize it. But, uh, I try to pull out the one of the haptic. And try yeah. to pull it and, and push it. And as I, I knew that, you know, that's uh cannot that won't center the optic. That's why I have to uh, redo a, the whole redock the, the, the haptic again. I see that. I think I think after doing this uh using this period haptic, I realized that previously when I do PMMA, 
this happen where I have to uh, adjust the when I use the PMA haptic uh, uh, as the uh, when I perform Yamani technique with the PMA haptic, this is what happened. Actually, there is a there's a deformation at the optic haptic junction. That's why if you pull push the whole both sides the haptic into the anterior into the eye, you find that the lens decentered or tilting. Then you have to manipulate the length of your haptic in order to reposition the optic. That is because your optic is actually tilted already. Because when I when I when I start using the uh, uh, this uh, haptic with PVDF uh, uh, haptic with PVDF the PVDF haptic, hardly any of this of this kind of incident happen anymore. I can actually both the end of the haptic can both can uh, push all the way to the sclerotomy and the lens is center most of the time. So it, it, if, if it's the center, it's because my entry point is different. It's not exactly 180 degree away, or it is not exactly two millimeter away from the limbus, maybe too, too short or too far. Previously with the uh, PMM haptic, almost 50% of the time, I had to manipulate the length of the haptic in order to make the optic uh, planar as well as center. So the problem actually is at the optic haptic junction. Okay. Mm. Mm. I think that's a good point. Uh. I think when you're doing all this uh, intrascleral sutureless fixation with the Yamane technique, what I found is I think Dr. Musha also showed very nicely, as uh, you mentioned, YY, if you are not exactly 180 degrees, you will get decentration. So if you think about it just now, Dr. Musha showed an extreme case where it was really quite far off by almost what five, six degrees. That's why you get a big decentration. If you're not exactly two millimeters behind the limbus, then you get tilt. So one of the things I found that when uh, I've done enough that like you, I uh, you know, end up with decentration, you can't adjust, you can't cut. So after cutting off the bulb, what I've done now is uh, you get your needle, you feed the haptic back into the actual needle, then use the needle and pass back to your old, follow back the old pass passage. So you can go into the eye, then you can free the haptic already. So you free the haptic, you grab it there, then you actually take back the needle out and go to your new position. So I found that that's one way to free the haptic easier. Lah. That's one thing. What kind of just uh, what kind of just pull pull out from inside? I use a reverse keyhole. It's very easy to pull it out. Yeah, I I just sometimes what I've done is when I pull out, you know, manipulating. Sometimes I find it's a bit blind. That's why I don't see it. Sorry, you know, Lisa, you were saying. Yeah, may I know what kind? Of anesthesia that you all do for these cases? Oh, they mentioned there was a question just now. I use local with uh, peribulba block with sedation. Peribulba. I use subtinon. I, I, I go for subtinon as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For complex cases, I'll go for subtinon. Fantastic. Yeah. Hmm. Peter? Uh, sometimes, sometimes I give a bit of top, uh, local subconjunctival over the side that's what they do, depending. Yeah. Okay. Carry Topical. Sorry. <laughs> I wish, I wish. Uh, something on Perry. Okay. Okay, I think we are 5.15 now. So we have we probably cannot answer all questions. Huh? Mama, can you ask you, ask you just one question? The, your last case where you reused the, the, the lens, PMMA, I think with the loop. Huh? Yeah. Uh, was the lens actually completely uh, dislocated in the, to, into the... Uh, Vitreous or was it dangling? It was actually dislocated in the vitreous. Oh, so okay. I actually did a bit of a, a bit more vitrectomy uh, yeah. than was shown because it was probably made vitreous. Uh. Yeah. So because both sides were broken. Both sides I uh, see. Switches were broken. Yeah. Yeah. Because if it's dangling, then you actually have to find that suture and cut it first before you can take out the lens uh, yeah. anteriorly, isn't it? Yeah. If it's 15 years, maybe you just yank it. <laughs> Can be risky yank, yanking, I think. <laughs> yeah. It was broken. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hmm. But nice, nice, nice way to recycle the eye oil. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So I think we can't answer, answer everybody, but uh, it looks like it was a great interactive session. I think we all generated a lot of discussion amongst the panelists as well. There's a lot of questions. I think we have still seven unanswered, but 40 plus questions. Okay, so I'm going to close up now and just firstly just to thank all the speakers. 
um, you know, a lot of effort has gone into editing, preparing, looking for all these videos. And uh, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for all your contribution. You're all very experienced as well in uh, all these aspects of them. And, what, and of course, to our sponsors as well for making this possible. And uh, as you have seen just now, uh, all the capabilities of the different uh, the, the different products available from our Alcon, Zeiss, and TGM uh, sponsors. And finally, of course, to our audience, the all I think up to we went up to about three hundred of you that actually came on board. And I hope you found this a good session and took away some uh, good messages and techniques as well. So I'm just going to share my screen now to show the last few slides. And of course, most important, of course, you realize is the uh, what do you call it? Your CPD you points. Are. So that's what you're hanging on for, right? So hold on a minute. Now. Let me get that out. Okay, share screen. Before I do that, just a little quick, uh, I won't say advertisement, but just to say that we are organizing together with uh, Borneo Ophthalmic uh, Surgical Symposium, you know, Dennis as well as Peter from East Malaysia, we have been, they have actually taken this initiative during the pandemic to start uh, this video festival and we are organizing it together by end of this year. So this flyer here, if you've got your phones out with your QR code uh, scanner, please scan this QR code, go ahead, I'll give you about 15 seconds and you can actually download some information about this cataract video festival. So it's a competitive thing. So those of you who are, you know, as budding uh, producers, uh, directors and what we call actors in your own surgical videos for cataract surgery, please uh, prepare them uh, accordingly. And then we look forward to uh, viewing your videos and it's going to be a competition with some nice attractive prizes as well. So this is with the cataract video festival in December 11th. Okay, so market calendars, we'll be sending out uh, reminders throughout the next six months uh, through MSO. And this is another QR code, but you know, not quite there yet because we still want your feedback. So if you don't mind, if you have your QR code scanner, please scan away. And this will take you to a, a Google form, which is a feedback form. Just a few, five questions, please answer it. And uh, I'll give you about a minute. Uh, once you fill in the actual feedback form, I will then flash your QR code so that you all can get your CPD points. Uh, I think for the panelists as well, please go ahead and answer their questions as well if you can. It's important that you can give us feedback so how we can come up with uh, better sessions and, and more uh, interesting topics and relevant topics for our coming future webinars or hopefully face-to-face -face meetings. We can also put that down as to one of the questions we're asking as well. We prefer virtual or face-to-face. Okay, I hope most of you have been able to access the Google form. Any problems from the panelists accessing this? No, how right? We, how no, we scan good. this, right? If we are using desktop? Uh, you use your phone. Uh. And then answer on the phone, is it? Yep, answer on the phone. That's interesting. <laughs> this is not the CPD points one, is it? No, no. this is not. <laughs> oh dear. Save, save the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to schedule my MMA thing, sorry. <laughs> That's what I meant. This is for your feedback. Feedback, sorry. Okay, I'm going to flash the MMA one now. I wonder if I can check how many responses I've got. Sorry, are you still seeing my screen or not? Yes. But I think you better flash out the QR code because it's going to expire. Okay, there you go. So thank you all for your participation. Do we have to do it? Yes. Yeah, okay. get your CPD points. You have to scan. For speaker, how do we get our speaker point? Uh, we will claim for you later. Oh. Later, <laughs> okay. No. Yeah, it's working. I got okay. my points. Done. Nice. For for oh. those who don't get your points, please uh contact Dr. Joe. <laughs> <laughs>
Dude, the penalties get any uh, bonus points? Yeah. Yeah, we should. get five bonus points. If you oh. don't have, co- contact Dr. Chung as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's good. Panelists just for asking some questions. I, that's, that's easy. Easy five points. Yeah. <laughs> oh okay. So maybe I should. We should cut it down now. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna leave this um, going. There are still questions here, actually. Oh. Does anyone want to answer the questions? Whilst actually, you, you can continue and answer the questions. Uh, it will, but it will continue to record actually. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there's a question for you, Prof Musha. If it's an 80 year old, are you still gonna do your money or not put in a, a ACR well? <laughs> uh, if you're comfortable with it, I think can because your money is quite quite fast actually. If you've done it quite a lot. I think the the thinking here, I suppose, is 80 year old. You know, and I see. well, it's probably more straightforward. The only thing about that I feel is if you're actually on the table with a complication and mm. you have a proper sizing, then it's difficult. Nah? If you actually right. do it secondarily, then you can size it properly, it's different. Exactly. Uh, Dr. Zaira, Zainal Abedin, any preference or type of viscoelastic used? I use DiscoVisc, which is like a combination of cohesive and, uh, and uh, dispersive. How about the rest? I think anything I is think fine. Anything will do. Even the anterior chamber, whatever available, huh? Yeah, I think uh, should should use an anti asymm antenna like, because it's really oh, it's firm. Yeah. It's, it's very important. Then you you don't if you are trying to needle a soft eyeball, I think you can do a lot of damage. You know, kind of corridor hemorrhage, and you may go into a slightly different look, position that you want to because the eye can be distorted. If you try to needle a soft eyeball, yeah. I will always, I think uh, AC maintenance is cheap, is essential. I think it's quite quite easy to do, you know. Yeah. A question about anonymous attendee. So we have an anonymous attendee. So on the certificate, <laughs> we should put anonymous attendee. For a beginner without any experience, start with Suchit or start with Yamani? Uh, good mm. question. What would you do? I think I, we, we all progress from suture to sutureless. That's the thing. For somebody with no experience, would you think Yamane is straight away? I think Yamane is still easier. I think Yamane yeah. is still easier. Less money yeah. is still easier. Less, less collaboration than to entangle the, less the, the, the suture. It, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's not easy, you know, suture. It's just that we have started doing it and then now we progress to Yamane. We think that uh, Yamane uh, is more difficult than the earlier because you have gained experience. The yeah. earlier experience, but it's like FACO and ECC here. You know, if you start with FACO, uh, FACO is much easier than, than ECC actually. If, if you, you start with FACO, uh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think they all have their different problems. Uh, you know, yeah. the uh, and you know, suturing. I find the probably the biggest problem is actually to do a good centration. You know, I think it's not not easy to do a good centration and then. And then trying to get the suture to be the right thought, you know, is not too much and not too too lax, you know. And then, uh, and then uh, I find that the tying technique is easier to to judge the thought. But when you're actually flanging, I think that's a little more tricky. Maybe I just haven't had enough experience. But I find, uh, you know, <laughs> like yeah, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mangwa yours was too big the bump. I think you know the you know, yeah. I, and Yamane, I think the is. If you are eventually you should evolve, I think it's a superior technique, like right? eventually, and it's not too difficult, you know. I think it's, I think it's like what, the trailing tap. Te- uh, I think that what makes the main difference is actually the PVDF. I think in the beginning we all have problem because it was the PMA I think this can kink easily. Now you use a PVDF, you can bend any way you want, so it's, it become a much more easier procedure. Yeah. Simply because of the haptic design and the material. I think the other thing is the trailing happening. If you, if you, I find that if you grip, you know, uh, I find if you grip it quite near to at the end of the haptic, uh, you find it quite easier to cannulate, you know, because, you know, if you grip it a long way from the end of the haptic, it's quite difficult because it can be in a very funny direction, you know. But if you grip yeah. it quite near the end of the haptic and cannulate the trailing haptic, it's much easier. And it, it actually, uh, uh, Yamane said himself, you know. Yeah. So usually I will leave the trailing haptic outside, yeah. 
so that when I grip it, I can grip it quite near the end of the haptic and then push it in the AC and then do the cannulation. I find that it's easier. Yeah. Does I'm not sure about the other experience. I'm uh, just using trailing actually. Yeah. I do externalize and then I just do the trailing haptic first. Oh, you do? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I do trailing. I, I don't know in my hand, I, I thought that the, the, Kim, the Brian Kim method is just mm -hmm. work better with me. Yeah. I mean, that's that's why you have very different ways to skin the cat. Anyone does combine SF IOL and glaucoma drainage device? Well, I don't, so I don't know. Do's and don'ts if you combine SF IOL with GDD. You mean in the single operation? I think so. That's what he's referring to. Uh, Dr. Hong Ki. Dr. Ng. So talking about very complex kind of procedure, isn't it? You have to yeah. And GDD with the, with the, just a normal uh, Mako. Yeah. I mean, you want to put a GDD means that uh, this patient has a fully controlled glaucoma that you want to control the glaucoma first, right? So mm. I would say you better do a glaucoma surgery first before you put in a lens for this kind of patient. Yeah. I think so. I've no experience doing that. I mean, I think already these kind of cases are complex enough that you don't want to combine them with other things. Huh? Not yeah. with a, not with a retinal detachment or diabetic TRD. I think no point. Huh? This kind of thing is <laughs> already complex enough. Yeah, I've seen uh, Dr. I Ahmad doing a, 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 actually a traumatic cataract and uh, the lens was very severely subluxed. So he actually managed to preserve the capsula back and then he fixed the lens to the sclera using suture. And then he did a glau glaucoma drainage, uh, put a glaucoma drainage device because the traumatic, uh, the IOP was 50, you know, after trauma. And he, he actually dared to go in and did the surgery. I thought you should medically control it, but he seems to get away with it and did a fantastic surgery. I mean, the surgery was fantastic, but you don't know the follow <laughs> up though. Yeah, true. I don't think it's, I think it's not, for everybody, I think we should still stick to basic principle and, you know, do it the safest way, get the IOP under control first and then go in. I think, yes. you know, you can get away sometime, but maybe not all the time, you know. Yeah. I think great, that the, great. it depends on who, who you speak with, but the value of retaining a bag, I mean, I Ahmed's recent YouTube video, he showed, uh, is it a Marfans or whatever, it's a microsclerous fake here with the lens, probably you can see like 20% of the lens sitting inferiorly and he would 20 or 30% and then you would want to retain that bag. You see how it hooks the bag out, you know, do a small CC. I mean, for us, I mean, I'm VR, I'm very much will agree, just lensectomy. <laughs> 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 just take, take it out. out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, one thing that we have to remember with the 27 gauge uh, needle, I find that my IOP is always a bit lowish on uh, the next mm. day. If let's say I've cleaned up the whole viscoelastic, so I tend to leave a bit of viscoelastic inside. So if you combine it with the GDD or all the filtering surgery, you might expect much, much lower IOP. So I think you have to be careful in that, in that situation. I don't know. I think YY uses 27G also, right? Do you get the same feeling? What feeling is that, right? The uh, IOP. The IOP being low, 27 gauge. You use 27 gauge, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not a 30 gauge. So the obviously the tunnel is a bit bigger. Does it leak a bit more, you think? Leak, yeah. Uh, because it's softer. Not, 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 not in my hand so far. I see. You see, the thing is that when I enter the sclera, I enter at about 15 degree, you know, to the sclera. And I actually create a little bit of about one millimeter of uh, sclera tunneling. So that the haptic, you know, uh, so that there is the the uh, the it's not like directly into the into the eye, so there's about a, a millimeter of a scalar, scalar tunneling for the haptic to get ankle uh, and sit within the intrascalar uh, in a more more solid manner, more stable manner. Okay. Any uh, anything else to add? I think we still got. 179 people that are still keen to listen. <laughs> so anybody, anybody have problem, a long-term problem with the uh, exposed or not so far infection, erosion from the not so far? Any, any of you? Yeah, oh, I, so good. I have had uh, exposure, which I had to reposition, but not to the extent where 
it was any infection. I mean, I had haptics coming through the con, so I had to push it back in. Yeah. I only had some problem with related to the PMMA haptic earlier on in my first, you know, my first, uh, I would say first 10 to 20 cases. I would say, you know, I tried to be a money technique. I, we did not know a few things at that time. In the Yamani video, I watched a few times, he didn't mention properly about the PG needle that has to be P PSK needle, never mentioned about the PVBF haptic. So we do not know about all these details. So we just do it based on what we see and what we heard, but nobody mentioned about the haptic is actually PVBF. Only later then we realized, you know, there's difference between the PMMA and PVBF. That's why when we use a PVBF, it's PMMA is so difficult. It's so difficult and, you know, uh, and, and so worry about the 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 deformation at the the, the optic haptic junction. Yeah, on the same note, I just want to uh, caution. Uh, I did uh, a case of capsular contraction with a three-piece PMMA lens, which have, which uh, which was placed uh, about ten years before, and I used the same lens. I cut off all the capsular fibers and used the same lens to uh, fix it with the Yamani. The next day, the lens twisted 180 degrees. So instead of uh, being uh, horizontal, the lens now wanted to, to become vertical. So, so this what confirmed what uh, YY was suspecting all along. Actually, there was a, a weakening at the haptic optic junction. So beware if you want to reduce a three-piece PMA lens, especially with long-standing capsular phimosis syndrome, where uh, this uh, capsular contraction may have distorted the lens or weakened that junction. If you use the same lens, uh, probably it will, it will lead to uh, 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 tilting of the lens. So in that case, I think wise to remove it and change with a new lens. Well, well the length of the intrascleral tunnel, the length of the tunnel play a role in, in that scenario. Uh, what I mean is that if the tunnel is short, um, then the haptic is like dangling yeah. kind oh, of no. thing and just, you know uh, the lens might just put it at that axis is, is, is there um, a possibility the, the, uh, I'm just talking about the lens the oh. tunnel I, I don't, I don't if, think so in that case yeah. if our tunnel is short yeah. then you know the haptic is just like hanging like that is, it, is there a possibility uh, no, it's, it's distorted like uh, the lens rotates um, yeah. Instead of uh, horizontal, it will rotate. You know what? Correct. Correct. Yeah. 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 This is tilted. Yeah. Because if you yeah. if you actually do just two point scleratomy, you are actually hanging the the haptic. Yeah. That you know, and then that's why if the optic haptic junction is tilted, the lens will be tilted. It's unlike a three. Unlike if you put the three piece IOL into the bag, the bag will conform it. Okay. Yeah. Hold the lens properly. Well, yes. this you are hanging two points. Yes. So in order to prevent this, uh, let's say the lens from tilting, that's why I when I create the scara tunnel, I actually make a little bit of tunneling inside the scara before I mm. enter to the eye. So, but I don't think I can handle, you know, I I and I, I mean some some people say two millimeter in length, but you see when you put two millimeter in length into the scara, then the way you tilt. You are going to cause distortion or tearing the, the ciliary body or sulcus that you don't see from outside. It's actually is happening inside. This is more dangerous because it may lead to hemorrhage, supercorridor hemorrhage or hemorrhage from the point where you tear the, the, the sulcus. Yes. So to me, the inner, the inner it's just too long. For me, it's just about one millimeter. Then I don't actually try to turn the needle to uh, 90 degree away to the, to the scara. You look at, imagine the haptic, the haptic actually come, you know, come come in this manner, you know, yeah. it's curved. So that's why I use my needle. I tried my needle as well as uh, my needle direction is not towards the center of the, uh, the eye. It's actually a little bit with some angulation so that the, the haptic will come up to the scara tunnel and a little bit of scara uh, tunnel of holding the, 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 the haptic. And that I think makes the lens more stable. Dr. Chung, there's a there's a question online. Um, mm -hmm. asking your experience with Cobal lens compared to C T two C L two O two. Can't hear you. Uh Oa. So Cobal compared to C T Lucia two O two. Ah C T Lucia, I tried 
try to get the CP Lucia, they are never able to provide English. Now, Lucia, now so. they say now full range. <laughs> so never use. So now they say full range, but already not using their lens uh -huh. anymore because it's already available. Either use the IQ or the uh, the the Kowa. The good thing about Kowa is pre preloaded, hydrophobic, and uh, the lens. You must try. The lens come out in a horizontal manner, no need to tilt and turn. <laughs> and is the price is very reasonable as well, isn't it? Yeah, uh, that one. <laughs> that is one. a bit expensive. Yeah, Koa yeah. is a bit expensive yeah. oh. compared to other lens. Biotech is, is quite nice. The, the lens also come out nicely because the plunger actually is a is like Y shape, you know. It actually catches on the haptic and push it out. So it doesn't turn, you see. Because the usual plunger we have uh, is is uh, more of a round thing. So the lens spin around inside, you know. But Whereas the, the biotech uh, plunger is actually a Y shape and it catches yeah. the, the haptic and so it doesn't spin, it comes out very nicely. I've used that uh, yeah, for some of my Yamane. Yeah. Right, I think the sclera length thing, I think is variable. Isn't it? I, I think this Dr. Steve Safran, he actually do a very short tunnel, maybe about 1.5 to 1 only, you know, and, and but classically, uh, most people do two millimeters, I think. Yeah. I, I can't understand the two millimeter, frankly speaking. How can you go two millimeter and then you turn your needle into the center part of your 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 the eye? You're going to tear somewhere. You either tear yeah. the anterior, you tear the posterior. Correct. If you I don't tear the anterior, you. <laughs> you means you're tearing the posterior part, which you don't see. It. And then you I think it's probably of hemorrhage. <laughs> I think that's why you need a firm eye when you're doing a, your tunneling. The sclera kind of thing. You need a firm eye. That's important, I think. I have tried to do it without a firm eye. And oh, that one definitely, yeah. A lot of uh, vitreous hemorrhage. Yeah, you need a firm eye and uh, easier to do. And, uh, and then you put, I put guide markings on the sclera, you know, roughly two, two millimeters. Some people also, I think, Mangwa, you do, you mark your needle. That's right. You know, roughly it's gone into about two millimeters. Right. Okay, lah. I think enough of your Saturday taken up. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. I got to sleep yeah, early. Thank you, everybody. Hey, you're going to advertise? Oh, you already? Okay, okay. No, no, you done it. So. Done it already for the boss MSCRF. Yeah, yeah. So I, can I expect a video from everyone here? <laughs> yeah, I'll, get, I'll, I'll submit one. one. <laughs> yeah, everybody submit one. Huh? Excluding okay, me. have a nice weekend, everyone. Good night. Right. Go for a nice okay. drink now. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Bye. much. And uh, stay Bye. safe. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.